Hey everybody, Argent here, and we're back with another low effort live stream. Why haven't I really been making normalish content lately? Uh, basically just been too busy at work, slash haven't had the agency. But, I don't know, I guess my video on the political beliefs of um, Bob Chipman was kind of normalish content. And I did do that review of Mother. But um, this, this book is pretty long, so I'm just going to try and get into it immediately, and I'll try to keep my introduction as short as possible. So, Elliot Rogers, the Raj, dodging the Raj, all that kind of stuff, the uh, the Supreme Gentleman. Uh, what can we say about Elliot Rogers? I think in a lot of ways, Elliot Rogers, and why he's such a fascinating figure, is he kind of summarizes, uh, he's kind of like Dark Side Phil in a sense, uh, that he is the kind of the lost generation, the millennials. He uh, was uh, obviously was an atheist. Um, he was born to kind of yup uh, piece of shit yuppie parents. He didn't really. His father wasn't really that involved growing up. He was largely raised by his mother. Uh, his parents obviously weren't married when they had him. Uh, there's just a lot of aspects of Elliot Rogers. Oh, he was uh, the result of based Honda civic nationalism, of course. But uh, that's yeah, so that's Rogers. kind of the, oh. uh, that's basically kind of why he's interesting. And as we go through this, we see a lot of kind of the the narcissism of people in that age group. We also see a lot of the. Um, the narcissism, the alienation, the lack of parental involvement, uh, the lack of meaning, and the kind of the, the beginnings of this, this race of uh, globalized people. Uh, people who are born completely within post-modernity, um, and, and kind of all the traditional things that give meaning to people, all the traditional things that would give direction to people's lives are basically gone. Um, so, regardless of how you feel about him personally, and, and I think it's going to be very clear that he was a patho he was a malignant narcissist. And the death to Normie's party is to a large extent founded, uh, or is kind of based on the thought of Elliot Roger. As we'll see, eventually what happens is because of his autism and his, his alienation, he will turn to his own version of far-right politics. Uh, and he'll just kind of descend into LARP and, and that kind of stuff. So, without more being said, let's get into this. And we're going to look at the Supreme Gentleman. Um, I have a reading app. I have the text of the book. So when we start, people in the stream chat, please tell me if the audio balance is okay. I'm going to try to not pause this as much as possible. Uh, there will be a video eventually on just a summary of Movie Bob. I'm trying to edit down his book. Because a couple people complained it was long, and I, I understand that. At the same time, I did like if I was just to have read the whole book and not skip through, it would have been like three times as long. So that being said, let me know if this is too fast. Let me know if you can hear it. I'm going to try not to stop it as much as possible. So uh, that being said, let's begin. Uh, and let us enjoy The Supreme Gentleman. My Twisted World, The Story of Elliot Roger, by Elliot Roger. Introduction, Humanity. All of my suffering on this world has been at the hands of humanity, particularly women. It has made me realize... What else would cause your suffering? I guess there's also natural evil, there'd be like disease and that kind of thing. But uh, aside from that, I don't know what else other than humanity. Realize just how brutal and twisted humanity is as a species. All I ever wanted was to fit in and live a happy life amongst no, humanity. No, he wanted to but be I was regarded as superior. Forced to it's going to be an very obvious. Of loneliness and insignificance, all because the females of the human species were incapable of seeing the value in me. This is the story of how I, Elliot Roger, came to be. This is the story of my entire life. It is a dark story of sadness, anger, and hatred. It is a story of a war against cruel injustice. 
In this magnificent story, I will disclose every single detail about my life, every single significant experience. See, that magnificent my story. Memory, we see the as well as beginnings of the narcissism. Have shaped my views of the world. There's nothing magnificent about this story. This tragedy did not story. have to happen. I didn't want things to turn out this way. No, but humanity did. forced it's my hand, obvious. and this story will explain why. My life didn't start out dark and twisted. I started out as a happy and blissful child, living my life he to was the fullest never in the world happy. I thought was good and pure. Part 1, A Blissful Beginning, age 0 to 5, on the morning of July 24 th, 1991, in a London hospital, I was born. I breathed in the first breath of life as I entered this world, weighing only 5.4 pounds. My parents must have been filled with happiness and pride the day <coughs> they had just witnessed the birth of their first child, pounds, and they the only Oliver Robertson Roger, I was born to young parents. My father, Peter Roger, was only 26 when he impregnated my mother, Chin, who was 30. Peter is of British descent, hailing from the prestigious Roger family. A family that was once part of the wealthy upper classes before they lost all of their fortune during the Great Depression. My father's father, George Roger, was a renowned photojournalist who had taken very famous photographs during the Second World War. Specifically of the Holocaust, acquire the family's lost fortune. My mother is of Chinese descent. She was born in Malaysia, and moved to England at a young age to work as a nurse on several film sets, where she became friends with very important individuals in the film industry, including George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. In other words, she was the she eternal She dated George thought. Lucas for a short time. My mm -hmm. mother and father had been married for a couple dated. of years before my mother became pregnant with me. We all know in what fact, means. her pregnancy was an accident. She had been taking pills to prevent pregnancy. And this is where we see the, my the beginnings of, of, of she fell Elliot the medication Rogers she took for that as the post-modern the the See, he, he's like, well, I was the result of basically a broken condom. My parents didn't want me. I guess they didn't abort him. Um, but, no, impregnated is good because it's children aren't really seen as a blessing anymore. It's, it's just, you can already see... He's the product of two people who didn't really know each other. They were just kind of randomly fucking, and he came about. Anti-pregnancy pills, and so their love making during this period resulted in my life. Love Only making. a couple of months yeah, after sure. my birth, I went on my first vacation. My parents took me on a boat to France. I was already a traveler. Of course, I have no memories of this trip. My mother said that I cried a lot at the time that I was born. My mother... Change the voice to... I don't know if I have Moon Man. Let me see here. What other ones do I have? Mother and father were living in a house in London, but shortly after my birth, prefer they decided this? to move to the countryside. Nah, I prefer Paul. I'm just going to leave it on Paul. Countryside. We moved to a large house made of red brick in the in the county of Sussex, Sussex. with vast grass fields surrounding it. No one is more traditionally British than this Elliot was where Rogers. I spent my early childhood, He's the new face the first of five Britain. years of my life, and it was beautiful. The memories uh -huh. I have of this period are only memories of happiness and bliss. My father was a professional photographer at the time, just in the stage of becoming a director. My mother gave up her nursing career to stay at home and look after me. My grandma on my mother's okay, side... Okay, if people want me to leave it on, on Dave desktop, I will. Just let me know if it's too hard to understand. Ma moved in with us to help out my mother. I would spend a lot of time with Ama during these years. This was a time of discovery, excitement, and fun. Fun. I had just entered this new world, and I knew nothing of the pain it would bring me later on. I enjoyed life with innocent bliss. I can remember playing in the fields and... Okay, we're eventually going to... get into it, but, um... This is kind of, I think, what's going to be the... the ruling class of the new world is the Eurasian elite. It's, it's not going to be... I mean, white people are eventually going to disappear in a lot of these places. It's not going to be really a brown elite. It's going to be like a Eurasian elite that's going to rule with an iron fist. Because in my experience, at least, the more high IQ, more like Aryan-looking... By Aryan, I mean like Northern European, like blonde hair, blue-eyed white people tend to be rice farmers at a much higher rate than Mediterraneans tend to. And in countries like mine, it's, yeah, it's, they're, they're still a, the vast majority of the uh, white population is not Mediterranean. It's um, Anglo-Saxons. And going on long walks with Ama to pick berries. She would always warn me not to touch the stinging nettles that sometimes grew in our fields, but my curiosity 
Oh, sorry, I should, should switch that back to Paul. Sorry. Curiosity got the better of me, and I got stung a few times. There was high, a swing in preference. the back of our yard, which I had many good times on. The first birthday I remember was my 3RD birthday. My parents threw a party for me in our field. I had a helicopter birthday cake. I can remember one of my friend's parents cutting off if the first piece. If only his parents were helicopter parents, this I threw might a not have turned out I was so expecting bad. to get the first piece. It was my birthday after all. My father bought me a toy tractor that I could ride around. He threw a fucking uh, narcissistic hissy fit when he was three years old. I think that says something. Ride around in, and I would play with it all the time after that. Sometime after my 3RD <laughs> birthday, we all went on a vacation to Malaysia, my mother's home country. I have only flashes of memory of that vacation. I enjoyed it very much. We visited We're gonna a get, of my mother's... We're gonna get to this later in the story, but his father spent all of his money to make a documentary about um, actors being anti-religious. So he literally blew all his money on like some shitty yuppie anti-Christian documentary. Unfortunately, he lost all his money, but that was part of what made him snap was what um, was the lack of, uh, of support from his father financially. Relatives for preschool. I was enrolled at Dorset House, an upscale all boys private Fucking school Dorset in the countryside. House? I didn't go to Dorset lived. House. I was forced to wear a uniform, which I hated because I had to wear uncomfortable socks up to my knees. I was very nervous and I cried on my first day there. I can remember two friends I made by name, George and David. He had I would friends in the sand, but with them, I didn't no like way. school at Dorset House very much. I found the rules to be too strict. My least favorite part of it was the football sessions. I never understood the game and I could never keep up with the other boys in the field, so I always stood by the goalkeeper and pretended to be the second goalkeeper. My favorite part was playing in the woods after lunch. I hated soccer too. There was a too, particular a climbing structure that I had a lot of fun with. My preschool <coughs> class once went on a field trip to the park, where I had the misfortune of getting lost. As my class was eating lunch, I ventured off to another area of the park, and when I returned, my class had moved on. I remember panicking and asking strangers for help. It was a terrifying experience for me. I was eventually led to my class by the strangers I talked to. I remember one funny incident when we were taking school pictures. They forced us to sit cross-legged, which I hated doing, so I absolutely refused to sit that way for the picture. The teachers eventually conceded, and the picture was taken with me being the only one sitting differently. The holiday season was the best part of the year for me. It must have been very cold in England, but I don't remember the cold. I just remember how much fun I had. I was filled with joy. I love how he's physically frail because he's like a half. My father helped me build a snowman once. We would start with little snow. It seems like a really disproportionate, um, like, per, like number of like school shooters and people who snap tend to be hapas. Um, it's too bad we can't have actual genetic research, but it would be interesting to see if there was some biological reason for that. I'm sure there is snowballs and roll them around our field until we formed the body and then we would decorate it during christmas my parents always had parties and gatherings my father's best friend christopher bess who is also my godfather came to our house frequently we would often go to my father's parents house in smarten kent i would call my grandmother on my father's side grandma jinx my memories of my grandfather george roger are faint he had fallen very ill at this period my father's brother, Uncle Johnny, had a son one year younger than, than me, who was named George, after my grandfather. I always played games with cousin George in Grandma Jinx's garden. The two of us got along well. On New Year's Eve, our neighbors once set up a bonfire party in the field next to our house. I was fascinated by how big the fire was. I had never seen anything like it, and it astounded my little mind. This was also the first time I saw fireworks. My father gave me one of those sparklers to play with, which I was enraptured by. There was one very special place that my father would often take me to. It was at the top of a range of beautiful rolling hills that I termed the London Hills, because I thought that London was on the other side of them. We would go there to fly kites. I can remember these experiences vividly. The hills were full of tall straw like grass, and the weather was always windy perfect for kite flying. It was a time of utmost happiness and joy for me. My father taught me to fly a kite by... Notice he says it was a time of happiness, but he describes just being completely miserable about everything. Fly a kite by myself. The wind was so strong that I feared it would lift up my frail little body and carry me into the clouds. Once I got the hang of it, it was exhilarating. 
We would fly our kites together and run with the wind. I will never forget that place. My favorite childhood film was The Land Before Time. I used to watch that movie all the time with Ama. I love that it movie. It was about that a baby dinosaur named shit. Littlefoot who had just lost his mother and was journeying through a dangerous world to find the Great Valley, a land of prosperity and peace. I remember the feeling of utter sadness I felt during the scene when his mother died, and the triumphant and happy emotions that swept over me when he finally discovered the Great Valley, after going through all the hardship to get there. I watched this movie so many times that just thinking about it brings the emotions back. It was a big part of my childhood. Already a world traveler, I went on a trip to Spain with my parents and my <coughs> parents' friends Patrick and Loop. Notice how he talks about himself. I was a world traveler. I was descended from British nobility. It's just, he's so extremely narcissistic, even about his childhood. I don't know. Loop. It was the fourth country I've been to at such a young age. We stayed in an exquisite castle-like house that I believe was owned by a friend of ours. The house had a tower that I was extremely curious about. At one point, my parents and their friends ventured up to the top of it, but they made me stay below because I was too young. I was sorely disappointed. As they were climbing the tower I went outside to look at the cacti surrounding the house. These cacti also sparked my curiosity, and I foolishly decided to touch a cactus. I ended up getting cactus There's that high time my hand, again. and it took a long time for my mother to remove them. Shortly after my trip to Spain, we went on another trip to Greece. We stayed at a hotel near the beach. It was very hot there. The weather was new to me, as I was used to the cold British climate. The trip to Greece was significant because during this time, my father received the news of the death of my grandfather George Roger. He died of natural causes on my fourth birthday, at the age of 87. It was the first experience I had of the death of a close relative, and the first time I saw my father cry. My four-year-old self could not imagine my father ever crying, and so when I saw him cry that day, I knew how shaken he was. His father cried when he was a very sad film. day for all of us. We immediately flew home. I believe that it was during the time after my 4th birthday that my father came to the decision to eventually move to the United States. As he was just becoming a director, he believed Los Angeles would offer more opportunities. We took a short trip to California to gain an initial look at it. I don't remember much of this trip, but I do remember having a good time. At the age of four, I it would be the last Walker, time had he had already been to six different anything. countries. Who can claim that? A. The United Kingdom, France, Spain, Greece, Malaysia, and the United States. It was also during this time that my mother became pregnant again. I was going to have a sibling. My parents decided to have another baby, this pregnancy being planned, so that I can have a sibling to grow up with. We later discovered it was going to be a girl. Before my 5th birthday, my mother went into labor to deliver the baby. I can remember the night vividly. I was very ill that night, a bad omen. I stayed at home with Amma while my mother and father were at the hospital, and we watched movies together. I was fraught with <coughs> anticipation the whole time. And then my parents came back late in the night, and with them they brought a little black-haired baby wrapped in a bundle. I had a baby sister, and they later he'll Georgia. describe how he listened outside the room with his birthday. sister. When Shortly she, after, we were making plans to permanently uh, move to the United States. When she lost States. her virginity to some Hispanic me, but guy, but I was sad at the prospect of leaving my life in England behind. My father took a short trip to the U.S. by himself to scout out houses. I remember talking on the phone to him while he was there. He told me he found a very nice house for us to move to. I asked him if it had a swimming pool, and he said he did. This news made me very happy, and then the time came. We started packing everything up at the old rectory. On my last day at Dorset House School, my teacher was giving all of us candies when my mother came to pick me up early. I said goodbye to all the friends I had there. That was the last time I saw them. My father was given the offer to buy the old rectory for about £400,000. We were only renting it at the time, but he declined, a decision he would regret later on, as it would have been a worthy investment. I cried as we drove away from the old rectory. All the experiences I had there. Playing in the fields, driving my toy tractor, tending to my garden, going on walks with Ama, swinging on the swing. All those experiences were gone. I was about to start a new life. We boarded the plane and took off to America. Part 2, Growing Up in America, age 5 to 9, the plane ride was like a dimension between worlds. I was about to enter a whole new world. A whole new life. But none of that went through my little 5 year old head at the time. I slept for most of the journey there, and I can remember looking out the window at the vast stretch of clouds below us. I wondered what it would be like to go down there and run along them as if they were a landmass, not thinking about the fact that I would fall right through. When we arrived in America, I was very tired. We collected our luggage and loaded them onto a new SUV that my father rented. 
the image of us driving out of the airport is still fresh in my mind. I often think of it as my first step into my new life in the US. I was so sleepy when we reached our new house that I didn't even bother to look around yet. The house was partly furnished, and we already had a sofa and sofa and a television. The first thing we did was watch a movie. The movie was movie was Independence Day, and I fell asleep at some parts, but managed to watch most I'm of the I'm sure there's some the irony to it being Independence energy. Day, but I can't I think of it I clambered up the, the stairs to search for my new room. Head. I looked at all the rooms before singling out the one that I wanted as mine. When I told my mother about my decision, she told me that the room I picked was meant to be my sister George's room. Uh oh. I got a bit upset, but eventually settled for the room next to it. Uh oh, the house that was, was the quite beginning. Big, with white walls and a beautiful backyard that led that to a gated street. That was what would eventually area. lead to It was located in an upscale part of Woodland Hills. The town of Woodland Hills has great significance in my life. It would be the town that I grew up in. A large portion of all my life experiences, good and bad, would take place in this town. I can recall the first time I said the name on my lips. Woodland Hills. My new hometown. Soon after I actually liked Independence home, Day we were disturbed Independence Day 2 of California, was, was an earthquake. awful. My mother woke me up yeah. in the middle of the night, and we all ate under the kitchen table. The earthquake actually turned out to be very small, with even smaller aftershocks following it, but I was still scared. Having never experienced an earthquake before, the only impression I had of earthquakes were the huge, land-rupturing earthquakes I saw in the land before time. After this experience, I began to see earthquakes that... Okay, TRS said something that I think is one of the most insightful politic, socio-political observations ever. That liberals know everything they know about the world from TV. And we'll see it here. We saw it when we looked at movie Bob, knowing everything he knew about the world from Mario. But they they just they tend to like just believe whatever they see on TV is the way the world is. And we're gonna see Elliot Rogers repeat this a lot throughout the book. But even here he's like, Oh, earthquakes are like the land before time. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Earthquakes as common, minor disturbances. And there I was, a young five year old boy who has so far lived a happy and joyful life about to embark on a new journey. The journey of growing up in the United States of America. I felt a surge of enthusiasm at the prospect. I now considered myself an American kid, as I told my parents. I got accustomed to all the American TV shows, and I started to adopt an American accent. I was looking for my that own means. life. Soon enough, I was enrolled in school. My father did some extensive school searching after our arrival. Yeah, that's another thing we'll look at. Is Elliot Rogers smart or not? It's really hard to tell. Pinecrest. My five-year-old self at the time could like, not, time could not. I I don't know. I don't know if Elliot Rogers is smart or not. I, I would tend towards thinking he isn't very intelligent, but at the same time, he is. Uh, he he does know how to use a thesaurus and how to pretend he's intelligent. Could not imagine how significant this place will eventually become for me. A great turning point of my life will eventually take place there, a tragic turn for the worse. But that will come later, in a darker chapter of my story, when I enter my preteen years. For now, I was a kindergartner who was enjoying life to the fullest. Kindergarten at Pinecrest didn't turn out so well. I had a very unpleasant teacher who was impatient with how far behind I was in my schoolwork, as I had missed a couple months of school due to the... In other work. words, he was a During little time, shit. This teacher would keep me in the classroom to do extra work in order to catch up. My parents didn't like this teacher, and one of their friends recommended another school for me, a private school near- Now, this is really interesting, um, how the, like, the only person of his childhood who tried to, like, make him less shitty, they kicked him out. Um, so, so yeah, so he was like, uh, you're really behind in school, you're gonna have to, like, stay, you're gonna have to do extra lessons, you're gonna have to learn- uh, uh, to read and we're going to uh, get you caught up and his parents immediate reaction was not oh this teacher actually cares about this job oh this teacher is gonna like help our son the reaction was no honey this this teacher is a big meanie we're gonna take you out of school you can't be allowed to um you can't be allowed to do anything um it's just it's it's bad so we're gonna take you and we're gonna put you in a private school where you don't have to try at all because we're fucking swipples school nearby named farm school it was named after the farm that was attached to it after only a couple of weeks at pinecrest my parents took me out of it and i would not return again until i go there for middle school six years later my 
I think not having stability in a child's life is is really bad for them. Like his parents are moving him around the world. They're switching him from school to school. They they aren't really teaching him any um, resilience. My first day at farm school turned out to be a good start. I had two teachers, and they made an effort to introduce me to the other kids. There was one particular boy named Joey who they assigned to show me around. He was nice to me at first, but would soon turn out to be a rotten little prick who I would always get into fights with. He then became my greatest enemy at the school. The first real friend I love how he had a mortal enemy at the age of five. Maddie Humphreys. That is Isn't impressive. Isn't that ironic? The first friend I made in the United States was a girl. She was the first female friend I've ever had, and she would be the last. Maddie and I started playing together at the farm only school, real and friend he ever had. became very good friends with her parents. Maddie's father is the famous British musician Paul Humphreys, and her mother is named Maureen, though we would call her Mo. They had a nice house in Hidden Hills. Our families got together often to have barbecues and dinners. I was a five-year-old boy playing with a girl my own age like any normal boy would do. I was enjoying life in a world that I loved. I was happy, and completely oblivious of the fact that my future on this world would he only turn to sound very and misery happy. because of girls. This girl who is my he friend, Maddie miserable. Humphreys, would eventually come to represent everything I hate and despise. Everything that is against me, and everything that I'm against. I was playing innocently with this girl. I love how he hates her. He hates this random girl from his childhood. Like, he doesn't even, like, remember her, but he hates her. Elliot Rogers hates literally everybody in his life. It's, it's one of the many reasons why he's a little shit. Girl, in the manner that all children play. We even took baths together. It was the only time in my life that I would see a girl my age naked. When I think about the experiences I had during my friendship with her, it makes me think ominously of the fact that all children, boys and girls, start out the same. We all start... What kind of guy thinks like that? Oh, I got to see this... This hot six-year-old girl naked. Oh, yeah. What a fucking creepy weirdo. All start out innocent, and we all start out, together. Only through the experiences and circumstances of growing up do we drift apart, form allegiances, and face each other as enemies. That is when wars happen, and that is when the true nature of humanity rises to the surface. At this stage of my life, of course, my war hadn't started yet, and it wouldn't start for a long time. I was what is it with these guys and the thinking uh, about that. it as war? I mean, we had, what's his name? We had Movie Bob's <clears throat> personal Vietnam. We had the console wars being like the great trauma of his life, and now we have Elliot Rogers talking about his, what, I, I don't know. But all of my joy is destined to turn to dust. My kindergarten year at farm school was filled with exciting, new experiences, all healthy for a growing boy. I had friends, I had playdates, what the I socialized fuck is with the play other boys at school, despite getting into lots of conflicts with Joey. I only got into trouble once, over a quarrel with another boy during playtime, and I was sent to the principal's office. Having never been in such trouble at school before, I recall being overcome with nervousness and fear, which caused me to cry for an hour. I especially enjoyed our arts and crafts time, and I loved it when our class would go on visits to the school's farm. After a bright and joyous school year, it was time to graduate. I was swelled with pride as I wore my graduation cap at the ceremony. I loved that school very much, and I was sad to leave it. Kindergarten was over, and soon enough I would enter elementary school. My 60th birthday soon followed. My parents arranged a Disney theme party at a play center that my mother had been taking me to frequently. I invited everyone from my farm school class, all the boys and the girls, except for Joey. I deliberately omitted Joey as an act of revenge for being Fuck Joey. the year, and I felt a sense of satisfaction in doing so. The party was cheerful, and there was a man dressed as Merlin to host the festivities. I sat at the end of the table during my birthday meal, wearing a wizard hat. As my cake was presented to me, I felt only... See, all the bad shit in his life was caused by Joey. Life was good. Six if only old, Joey had My favorite there. part of the day during this jubilant period of my life was our afternoon trips to the park. Specifically, Serenia Park. This park was beautiful and green, with concrete pathways cutting through fields of grass and a fun playground for us kids to play in. I always took to playing on the slides, and sometimes I would go on the swing, though my father had to push me. I remember getting jealous of other boys who were able to swing by themselves, boys who were even younger than myself. Once again, jealousy, the second time hating I everybody. My lack of physical capability. Has he expressed liking for anybody at this point in his like has he said he likes anybody? The only person I think he likes is his um Asian mother who just spoiled him, and that's the only reason he likes her. Capability. 
The first time I had such an inkling of my shortcomings were those disastrous football sessions at Dorset House. Eventually, my father got around to teaching me how to swing by myself, and after some practice, I was able to do it. After that, I would always soar up and down on that swing in the Serenia Park playground well into the hour of twilight. I was very small and short-statured for my age. I never gave this Inferior much concern during my early childhood, but this fact fully dawned on me the day my family took a trip to Universal Studios. At the time, I loved dinosaurs. I was fascinated by them. I had just recently watched the movie Jurassic Park, and when I found out that there was a Jurassic Park themed ride at Universal Studios, I couldn't wait to go on it. We queued up in the line and waited for an hour. When we reached the front, the parks park staff presented me with a measuring stick, and I didn't fit the requirements. I saw other boys... Uh oh, this was the start of it. Uh, the murder spree he would later go on was all because he wasn't allowed on the Jurassic Park ride. That was the beginning of it. <coughs> Admitted onto the ride, but I was denied because I was too short. The ride that I was so excited to enjoy at the theme park was forbidden to me. I immediately fell into a crying tantrum, and my mother had to comfort me. Being denied entry on a simple amusement park ride due to my height may seem like only a small injustice, but it was big for me at time. Little did I know, this injustice was very small indeed compared to all the things I'll be denied in the future because of my height. We resorted to trying out the E.T. ride, which I was admitted to. I had a miserable time on this ride, however, because the dark atmosphere... Literally, he's like, it all began. There was fucking Joey. There was, I don't know, this other bullshit. But it was, it would all just, it would just be the worstest shit ever. Dark atmosphere and the mechanically moving alien statues that lined the queuing area scared the hell out of me. By the time we got to the actual ride, I was crying in fright, but later calmed down. Also, ET was a wild shitty and movie. Towards the end. I always enjoyed my family's get-togethers with the Humphreys. These get-togethers <coughs> were an occurrence in my life. Maddie became a very close friend of mine. She was the only friend from farm school who I continued to see after I graduated. They had a huge backyard area, and the two of us would go on adventures. She She's kind of like Elliot Rogers, Sarah and we would watch the sequels together whenever they released a new one. Sometimes when I went to her house, she would have other female friends there, and I played with them too. I had no trouble interacting with girls at that age, surprisingly. My six-year-old self was playing with girls, unbeknownst to the horror and misery the female gender would inflict upon me later in my life. In the present day, these girls would treat me like the scum of the earth. But at that time, we were all equals. Such bitter irony. It was now time for me to start first grade. My aren't parents we, were we Serena all Avenue equal? Aren't we all equal which was the just down the street from Serena Park. That's I wouldn't I remain at the school for long. However, because only weeks into my first grade year, my parents decided that they were going to move to Topanga. Most of the kids at Serenia Avenue School will end up going to Taft High School nearby, a place that will cause me great suffering in the future. Perhaps some of the kids in my class at Serenia will end up turning into those who would bully me at Taft. I don't remember any of the kids from my class there, so I will never know the answer to that. It's very disturbing to think about. I quite enjoyed my brief time at Serenia. My parents sometimes made me stay an hour after school. I believe this was because they figured it would help me make friends. I can remember this after-school playtime being a positive experience. There were always games that I played with the other kids. And thus I was a bit frustrated when my parents told me they were going to transfer me to another school after only a couple of weeks of settling into Serenia. The frustration would soon cease, because the years that I would spend at Topanga Elementary School would be some of the best years of my life. The last years of being a carefree child, I started first grade at Topanga Elementary School a couple of weeks before we prepared to move to Topanga. Topanga is a secluded, mountainous community surrounding a canyon that runs through the Santa Monica Mountains, located in between the San Fernando Valley and the Pacific Coast Highway. We had only passed through this community a few times when we would take trips to the beach. It has a, has a certain rugged beauty about it. On my first day at Topanga Elementary, I was very nervous. Since it was about a month after the first grade term started, I was going to be the new kid at school. I remember the nervousness taking over my body as my mother drove us up the steep road that led into the school proper. My new class was just lining up to start the day as we walked onto the main courtyard. My teacher, Mrs. Matsuyama, was very nice and understanding. My mother said goodbye Another and Asian. Line with the other students. The first kid I saw there was a chubby boy named Bryce Jacobs, who was staring at me strangely. Fuck you, Bryce Jacobs. Mrs. Matsuyama signed one of the students to show me around and help me adjust. This student happened to be none other than Philip Blozer. What are the odds Philip he's just making very this whole thing up age, and he doesn't he actually nice remember any of this? Day. I think that seems pretty likely to me, The day to be perfectly turned out to honest. be one of great fun. Class time was not too boring, and we did some fun arts and crafts activities. For recess and lunch, there were two playgrounds, the upper and the lower. The first and second graders would go to the lower playground, and the third, fourth, and fifth graders would go to the upper. The lower playground was smaller, but it had some nice amenities, especially the sloping hill to the side of it, where I would enjoy running up and down kicking dust, a game I instantly created due to the dust-like dirt on this hill. When my mother came to pick me up, I recall having so much fun that I didn't want to leave. That's a first. 
In the past, I was always eager to go home after spending hours at school. The drive to and my mother picked me up early from school. It was the end of the world. I knew one day I would have to kill her, like I knew I would have to kill everybody else. Drive to and from school was a long one, or at least long for my six-year-old self. My favorite part of the drive was the descent from into the, into the valley. Oh, okay. The view of the broad expanse of the valley was breathtaking as it opened up before us after clearing the final hill. I would make that trip through the winding roads of Topanga Canyon every day for the next couple of weeks before we moved to the new house. Sometimes my mother would pick me up, and sometimes my nanny would. I don't remember the name of this of course nanny, but she was nanny. only with us for a brief period of time. I loved the new house the moment I laid eyes on it. It was a beautiful, round, wooden house located up the road from Valley View Drive, in the better part of Topanga. It had two stories, a swimming pool, and a lovely deck that provided a view of the lush mountains. I instantly named it the Round House. I was sad to leave our house in Woodland Hills, our first house in America. I would miss the good times I had there, playing with Maddie and my other friends. They moved again? The, pool, the close proximity to Serenia Park. Yeah, where that's I spent a definitely lot of part of why he was of a carefree up. childhood. His family were literally like, yeah, they were they were uh, blah, 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 blah. rootless cosmopolitans. I mean, that's kind of a uh, that's a uh, yeah a recipe for disaster right there. Childhood, our new round house in Topanga, however, turned out to be a worthy replacement. My room at the round house was a bit smaller than my old one, but I remember it being very cozy. Shortly after we moved in, Ama came to visit from England, and she baked my favorite peanut cookies. We had some very happy times during the beginnings of my life there. My father's... She baked me peanut cookies, but because of the unfairness of the world in the uh, the previous years, I had developed a... Um, I developed an allergy to peanut cookies. The peanut cookies made me break out. I developed scars that would haunt me for the rest of my life. The scars from the peanut cookies meant I could never get laid. I vowed one day I would kill my grandmother as well father's new directing career was taking off quite well too and he would go away a lot to direct commercials for prestigious companies leaving my mother and the nanny to look after me the only downside of this was my father's absence from my life despite this i always looked up to him as a powerful and successful man <coughs> adjusting to my new environment in topanga was quite easy for me especially since school was so much fun i was now a topanga kid during recess at school, I started noticing this boy with slightly long blonde hair who also enjoyed kicking dust. Uh -oh. Before I met him, I always mentally nicknamed him the King Arthur Kid, due the regal look his hairstyle gave him. Uh -oh. It was only a matter of time before our dust and kicking antics would he collide with each other. He met his first Aryan Superman. We then teamed up and started playing the game together, and this was the start of a long and interesting friendship. This boy's name was James Ellis, and he would become my best friend for the next 14 years of my life. Sometimes, the two his of us would join with Philip Bowser and, and some other boys and play fun mother. games like handball, war games, and tag. Soon enough, I would start having frequent playdates with James Ellis. Who the fuck says playdates? His house play was just down the hill from mine. James' father was named that says something. and his mother, Kim, became one of my mother's best friends. Christmas arrived quickly, and for my present I got my first video game console, a Nintendo 64. I had little knowledge of video games before this. I barely knew what they were. And that was the beginning the of one what would be a long and slow With the Nintendo end. Nintendo 64, my father bought the games Star Wars, Shadows of the Empire, and Turok. That game Dynasty was the Hunter. shit. I, I was fascinated with this new form of entertainment, and my father and I would bond a lot over our video game sessions. Of course, while playing these video games, my innocent hat. My father likes strategy games, so we would bond over playing Civilization. And the early Command and Conquer games together. Innocent, happy self knew nothing of the significant role video games would play during a large portion of my life. And the sanctuary such games would eventually provide for me from the cruelties of this <laughs> world. For now, they were just a form of entertainment like any other hobby. Life was good at the round house, but soon enough I had to witness my mother and father get into a lot of arguments. I was too young at the time to understand what they were arguing about, but I knew they were not getting along. It didn't really concern me all too much, because every other aspect of my life was wonderful. I had playdates with James Ellis every week. Sometimes he would surprise me with a visit after school, as we lived so close by. I went over to Philip Blozer's house a few times as Philip well, Blozer. and I met his younger brother, Jeffrey. The Blozers also became good friends with my mother. They lived in a nice house up the road from our own, with a deck that provided an extraordinary view of the Topanga Mountains. At some point I learned about the possibility that parents can separate. Divorce no longer live together the prospect 
So let's just briefly summarize. Okay, so he was the result of a broken birth control pill. His parents didn't want him. They kind of stayed together over guilt. At least that's how I can um, I can determine. And they kept moving from place to place to place. His parents started fighting and they got divorced when he was... How old was this? Like eight, eight or nine years old? Yeah, that's not a recipe for disaster. Prospect baffled my little mind. I once sat down with my mother on our outside deck and asked her if she and father would ever divorce. She told me it will never happen. Yeah, and that I had so she lied to, to him. I was relieved by that. That's a good thing Little to do, I child. Such a thing would happen in only a few months' time. And then it happened. My first grade year ended splendidly. I made a few lasting friends, and I had a blast at Topanga <coughs> Elementary. I always considered myself a good, well-behaved student, so I was a bit he disappointed at the few student. times I got in trouble. My class had a system where if we do something wrong, we would change our card color from green to yellow, and then to red if we did any more troublemaking. I thought I would what kind of gay have to shit is card, that? I had to change it to yellow a few times for it's minor like the things. Gayest shit I've ever when heard. first grade ended, I made the resolution that in second grade I will never be forced to change my card. After my last day of school, I was looking forward to a long summer break. I had to change my card to red. And when I changed my card to red, I knew one day I would change the walls to red and my hands to red. Break, my favorite time of the year. <coughs> I was a bit dismayed when my parents made me attend summer camp. <coughs> my father had to go away a lot for work, and my mother needed to have some time to look after baby Georgia. Summer camp wasn't all that bad, I had some fun. It consisted of kids from first through fourth grade, and we played lots of games and watched movies. Seven years old. My last memory of my parents being together was my 7th birthday, and I would always cherish it. We didn't have a party for my 7th birthday, but more of a small get together for lunch. Maddie and the Humphreys were our only guests. We celebrated it at Gladstones, my favorite restaurant at the time. It was in the Pacific Palisades, right on the beach. I had my favorite meal, lobster. It was a very happy day for all of us. I was turning seven. That it would be the last happy day. I, I had spent have. seven years on this fascinating world, and my life was at a good start. I had loving parents. I had little did I know. I was having fun at school, and wrong. I had all the toys a little boy could want. A stranger would look at the seven-year-old boy and think that he has a great life in front of him, that there is nothing to worry about. Uh, yeah. Indeed, there shouldn't be anything to worry about. But I was just a child. I still had a few more years to enjoy life in carefree bliss before I would eventually discover how twisted and cruel this fascinating <laughs> world really is. <laughs> I remember them laughing and having a good time. It would be the last time I remember them being happy together. Perhaps they really weren't, perhaps they were, just putting up a front so that I could enjoy my birthday. I couldn't even fathom the possibility of my parents separating. Very shortly after my seventh birthday, the news came. I believe it was my mother who told me that she and my father were getting a divorce. My mother, who only a few months before told me that such a thing will never happen. I was absolutely shocked. Hey, Elliot, uh, you know how I life. said we were going to get a divorce? Well, fuck you, I lied. We are going to get a divorce, you asswipe. And, um, yeah, you're, yeah. <laughs> So his mother yet lied to him about something really important. Uh, I think that's good. I don't think there's any way that that could possibly backfire later on. So yeah, just uh, we'll build on that. Above all, overwhelmed. This was a huge life-changing event. My father was to stay at the round house, and my mother would move to another smaller house in Topanga. It was arranged that me and my sister will mostly be living with our mother, and we would go to father's of course house he'd on the weekends. With his mother. My father was required to pay child support to my mother so that she can look after us. Of course us. there was my child support involved. Forever after this. The family I grew up with has split in half, and from then on I would grow up in two different households. I remember crying. All the happy times I spent with my mother and father as a family. I think a complete lack of... Uh, of positive masculine influences is is a very big reason why things turned out the way they are if my father wasn't around and he wasn't the man he was god knows how what i would have grown up to be like family were gone only to remain in memory it was a very sad day just like the move to the u.s it would be like starting a whole new life with a new routine despite the initial sadness i felt from my family splitting in half my new life situation wasn't all that bad it was still practically the same life, though I lived with my mother in one house and my father in another. My mother's new house was small and red in color, located up a steep driveway from Topanga Canyon Boulevard. I would call it the Red House. It was the smallest house I've lived in at that point. 
It only had two bedrooms, and I had to share a room with my sister Georgia. We had a bunk bed, and I slept on the top. I was quite uncomfortable with this change at first, being used to having my own room and living in bigger houses. My mother's kind and loving nature, however, made up for this, and she turned the household into a fun environment which I enjoyed living in. After spending the first week at mother's house, father came to pick me and my sister up for the weekend. Georgia had become very attached to mother after this week, and she burst into tears when we drove off. I too, was a bit distressed at having to go from one house to the other every week, but I would soon get used to it. The round house was very different without mother being there. When we entered, I felt a wave of sadness creep over me as I was reminded of my life when mother and father were together. The house was full of memories. Happy, cheerful memories that were lost in the past. With my mother missing from it, there was a sense of bleakness and loss to the place. Father did his best to cheer us up. I could tell that he, too, was very saddened by the recent events. My father soon rented one of the rooms of the round house to his good friend Dan Pirelli, one of his first friends in America. Dan used to live close to our house in Woodland Hills until he was struck with financial troubles, which I'm assuming is why he started renting a room from my father. I would always call him Uncle Dan. From this point on, Uncle Dan would stay with us as a lodger for a few years. The time to start second grade arrived. My new teacher was named Mrs. Weisberg, and she was very kind. The students in Mrs. Weisberg. Students in my class were mostly the same as my first grade class, with only one or two new students who transferred from other schools. I made a few new friends, such as Shane and Tommy. I was very disappointed to find out that James Ellis would not be returning to Topanga Elementary for second grade. In fact, his family would be moving out of Topanga to the Pacific Palisades, where they would be renting a house from their friends, the Lemelsons. My father's stay at the round house was very brief. He suffered some temporary financial setbacks on top of the divorce, so he decided to move to a smaller house on Old Topanga Canyon. It was a very abrupt move, and I would never see the round house again. One day, after he picked me and my sister up from mother's... The round house was house the red it. door the for Elliot Rogers. And I applaud you if anyone gets that reference. The upstairs portion had only a bedroom and bathroom, and it was rented to Uncle Dan. All around the outside of the house were very small hills and hiking trails that led up to the mountains. Overlooking these hills was a massive, imposing rock called Big Rock. When I first saw Big Rock, I told myself that one day I'll climb to the top of it. I took a liking to this new environment, and every time I visited Father on the weekends, I would always be outside, exploring and adventuring. There were always new places to discover in that secluded region. I didn't venture too far into the wilderness, however, because of the danger of coyotes and mountain lions. After only a couple of months since my seventh birthday, a new and very important person would come in. I gotta be honest, I actually do find this story, like, easy to listen to and read. Elliot Rogers isn't really a bad writer per se. I actually find this interesting come into to my listen life. to. After father picked us up from school one day and took us to his house, I saw a woman with dark hair and fair skin standing in the kitchen, and she introduced herself as Smaria. She would become my stepmother. Father told me she would be living with us from now on. At first, I thought she was just another friend who was temporarily staying with father, similar to what Uncle Dan was doing. My father having a girlfriend so shortly after divorcing my mother didn't even occur to me. I couldn't understand it. Soon enough, though, I realized that Smarty was, in fact, his girlfriend, and they were together just like how my father and mother were together. It was the first time I learned the concept of a girlfriend, and it was hard to grasp. Before that, I always thought a man and a woman had to be married before living together in such a manner, and that it would take a long... See, Elliot Rogers actually had kind of a based opinion on that, but the general douchey nature of his family would eventually, I don't know, you know what I'm trying to say. Long time for such a union to happen. Father finding a new girlfriend in such a short amount of time baffled me. I was completely taken aback. Because of my father's acquisition of a new girlfriend, my little mind got the impression that my father was a man that women found attractive, as he was able to find a new girlfriend in such a short period of time from divorcing my mother. I subconsciously held him in higher regard because of this. It is very interesting how this phenomenon works. That males who can easily find female mates garner more respect from their fellow men, even children. How no, it's is it that my not father, one of those men who could easily find a girlfriend, as a son who would struggle all his life no. to find a girlfriend, I soon became accustomed to Somalia being part of father's household. She hails from the Akabun family, a very prominent family from the country of Morocco. For the initial period of her being a new member of the family, we got along well, and she was quite fun. We have some but other like, random a person from some random country. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's, it's good. It's good for Elliot Rogers. Having like this random new mother figure that he never knew before is, is not going to hurt him at all. Way that I wasn't used to. I felt that because she wasn't my real parent, she had no right to discipline me in such a way, and so I rebelled. That's where the first conflicts arose. There would be many more to come in later years. Along with the addition of Somalia, I had two new nannies. The first nanny was a French woman named Celine, though she was only with us for a brief period, so I don't remember much of her. My second nanny was a German woman named Christine. Christine would stay with us for a year, and I became very fond of her. 
She would always look after me during my time at father's house, and whenever I went on my adventures into the hills, she always accompanied me. Halloween this year marked my first time going trick or treating. My mother took me to my friend Shane's house, and we walked around his neighborhood collecting candy. Still obsessed with dinosaurs, I dressed up as a dinosaur for the Halloween. Trick or treating was a new thing for me, as it wasn't so popular in England. When it was all over, I was amazed that I had so much candy. Even though James Ellis no longer went to Topanga Elementary, he was still my best friend, and I saw him a lot. Mother would take us to his house in the Palisades almost every week, where I would play with James, and Georgia would play with James's sister Sage. He got me interested in a new phenomenon that gripped many children of the era, Pokemon. When I got my first Game Boy console, I started playing Pokemon Red version, and I was hooked instantly. I then started collecting Pokemon cards, and James and I always compared and traded them. The Pokemon and cartoon became my favorite show on television. It was a very fun, captivating hobby, and every boy at my school had a folder of Pokemon cards. It provided something to have, something to show off, something to talk about. The best cards were the shinies, and everyone coveted them. Much Mother like Chris Chan, Pokemon, so the to the red Pokemon cards were going to be, One always, um, always will be a huge Star Wars downfall. Fan. I had already seen the original trilogy many times, and I considered myself very lucky to be able to go to the premiere of a new Star Wars movie. It was because his mother used experience. to bang George Lucas. It was just me and my mother Georgia was too young, so she stayed at home with a babysitter. Episode 1 is infamous for being the lesser movie of the three new prequels, but as a kid I enjoyed it very much. Afterwards, I met some of the actors, and I shook the hand of Jake Lloyd, the actor who played Anakin Skywalker in the movie. That's My second grade year flew by like a breeze. I don't remember much of it, but I did have a blast. During recess and lunch, I played a lot with Shane and Tommy. We would play Pokemon on our Game Boys, and sometimes we would have playdates where we played Nintendo 64 games such as Banjo Kazoo, Super Mario 64, and Donkey Kong 64. I failed also to Mario 64, card, which really So we have Mario 64 I went through and Pokemon cards. But right when the year was about to end, I was caught talking in class with a friend named Danny Donnie, who sat next to me, and I had to change my card to yellow. I blame Danny for it because he was always talking in class. Fuck you, Danny! You are the reason all this stuff. Summer came quickly, and within my ATH birthday. My ATH birthday was mellow, but pleasant. I remember my mother inviting a few of my friends from my second grade class and we had a cake. During my weekend at father's house, we all went to the restaurant Typhoon in Santa Monica to celebrate it. It was quite a fancy restaurant next to a small airport, and they had a lot of exotic dishes that I tried. Eight years old. As I was now eight years old, father decided that I was old enough to climb Big Rock. Whenever I was at father's house, I would always see Big Rock looming in the distance, and the I was just itching to climb rock? it. I had already conquered every other rock in the area. There was only Big Rock left. And so I set out with father and a few of father's friends to finally climb to the top. The furthest I had climbed on this rock was about halfway up with Christine. There was a very steep rise which I wasn't able to ascend without some help. The second half of the journey was quite a challenge, but it was so exhilarating. I was very nervous the higher we climbed. The best part, of course, was reaching the top and the sense of accomplishment I felt. I finally did it. Looking down, I could see the vastness of the old Topanga Canyon region, and Father's house looked tiny down there. I was too scared to venture close to the edge, and I felt a sense of dread at the prospect of falling from such a height. The way down was even more challenging, but I felt so proud of myself for climbing that rock that it wasn't as scary as I thought it would be. I was very excited to start third grade. As third graders, we now got to play in the upper playground at Topanga Elementary, and I considered myself one of the big kids. The upper was vast, with a bigger playground, more handball courts, and four basketball courts. My classroom was located in a bungalow adjacent to the upper, and my teacher was named Mrs. Bunting. She was a young teacher. I believe she was in her late twenties. Being used to having very old teachers, I was surprised at how young my new teacher appeared. I continued to play with the same friends during recess and lunch, where we would spend our time. My, my, my first te- my young teacher, she didn't have sex with me either. I used to fantasize about her. I knew that she would be yet another person who I would make pay for the crime of having a better life than me. Spend our time comparing and trading Pokemon cards. In the midst of elementary school, I didn't interact with girls much, but this was normal. I was at that period of life where the boys played with the boys and the girls played with the girls, completely separate from That's each how other. life always the girls is. were the last thing on my mind. Maddie was still the only friend I had who was a girl, and I only saw her on the occasions when our families would have a get-together, which became more and more rare after Maddie's parents divorced and Paul Humphreys moved back to England. Of course her parents divorced. The girls divorced. in elementary school were part Everybody's of the Everybody's parents divorced Despite this story. not having much interaction with them, they treated me cordially, as they treated all other boys of my who age. Who says cordially? This was fair, and I age. was content with this. I hadn't gone through puberty yet, and so I had no desire for female validation. My eight-year-old self had no inkling of the pain and misery girls would cause me once puberty would inevitably arrive and my sexual desires for girls would develop. Sexual desires that would be mercilessly spurned. <laughs> so I would grow up to be embraced by girls while I would grow up to be rejected by them. But at that moment in time, we were just innocent children growing up together. All innocence is destined to be shattered and replaced with bitter brutality. I was living in ignorant, innocent bliss. And I was happy with it. This period of my life, aside from my early childhood in England, was one of the best periods. Life was fair and life was satisfying. As kids, proving our self-worth and gaining validation among our peers was achieved in a fair manner by how good we were at the games we played, or how big our collection of Pokemon cards were. No one had unfair advantages. This was perfect, and this is how life should be. And, boy did I have a lot of fun. 
James's family had to move to yet another house in the Palisades. Yep, and everyone keeps moving. She no negative impacts on James's children. Parents, Kim and Art. James and I would battle on our Game Boys, trade Pokemon cards, and walk to the recreation center down the street to play in the pool. And then for dinner we would all go to the restaurant Motsky in the center of the Palisades. I was quite proud of my collection of Pokemon cards. I had gained a few shinies over the last few months, and I enjoyed showing them off to other boys. Shiny cards came randomly in card packets our parents would buy for us. The card that I coveted the most was the Cherizard card, and one morning when my mother opened the packet for me and I looked through the new cards. There it was. It felt like the best day ever, and I was swelled with excitement. I jumped up and down all around the red house, and I couldn't wait to show it to James, who already had a Cherizard himself. Through being friends with James Ellis and going to his house a lot, we became acquainted with the Lemelson family, who are family friends of Kim and Art. The Lemelson family is a very wealthy family who has been financially helping James's family for a while. Rob Lemelson is the son of Jerome Lemelson, the inventor of the barcode, and his net worth is wow. $100 millions. Rob's son, Noah, is our age and great friends yep. with James. There, there's no privilege here. He went to a private school with the inventor of the fucking barcode. But no, he was he was fucking disadvantaged. He had no privilege in life. None. Ellie Rogers was a, actually privileged. With him too, though we would never be close friends. Sometimes we would all go to the Lemelsons' no house, it was also in the Palisades, and them. the three of us played together. For Halloween, we went to the Lemelsons' for trick-or-treating, and from then on it would become tradition to go trick-or-treating with them. I dressed up like a dinosaur again, because I couldn't think of anything else to be. I wanted to dress up as Ash Ketchum from Pokemon, but no store had that costume in stock. The Palisades was full of wealthy families. Oh my god, he also dressed up as Ash Ketchum? Wow. Families, so the candy they gave us would be in much larger amounts, obviously. <laughs> I remember competing with James and noticed who would get the most candy at the end. Afterwards, we would have dinner at Rob's house, and then we would dump our candy in Fuck you, I got more candy done. than you, you That was my favorite part right. of it. Oh, oops. Early in my third grade year, my mother would often take us to a festival near Topanga Canyon Boulevard, where small concerts were held and people barbecued great food. A friend of hers had something to do with these events, and I played with the son of this friend. He was named Riley Annapal, and he was two years younger than me. A first grader. I played with some other younger kids there as well, peers of Riley, and I had a good time. Riley became a common friend for a while. The significance of this is that Riley Annapal would eventually become someone I would harbor a great hatred for. Riley would grow up to get lots of girls, and I would grow up to be rejected by girls. But back then he was a friend, a peer, and we were playing together as equals. It's funny how the world works. When the holidays arrived, my father announced that we were going to take a family vacation to Somalia's home country of Morocco and meet her family there, and afterwards we were to stop by in England. I wasn't excited about Morocco. Okay, this is really weird. Okay, so they're going to Morocco, so another random Morocco, place. Since I didn't Who the fuck would want to go to Morocco? Morocco? And I wasn't too excited about the Fucking fact that we'll be staying there for six weeks either, which meant that my months. entire winter break would be spent in a foreign country that I knew nothing about. But of course, I had no choice in the matter, nope. and Morocco was added to the list of the many countries I've been to at such a young age. I looked forward to visiting England afterwards and seeing family there. Morocco was very strange and foreign to me, even more so than the land, <coughs> which was more westernized. I found it to be very backwards, though it had a lot of culture and the people were friendly. I remember disliking they were friendly the when they were trying to the sell you and junk. Is so there, though they lived walking was there from each other. I met Watto, and Watto enslaved me, and eventually an American Jedi would come and rescue me. His name was Qui Gon James. I don't know. From each other in the Casbah, a historic community located in the center of Tanya. Sumania's mother, Khadija, has a small but elegant house, and her father, Abdeslam, has a very large, almost castle-like house that is famous for being a location where a scene from James Bond, The Living Daylights, was shot. This fascinated me, as I was a huge James Bond fan at the time. In the center of this house there was an open courtyard where I always played with a kid named Eamon and his two younger brothers. They were adopted by Sumania's father a few years ago and lived with him. After a long stay in Morocco too long in my opinion we made our stop in England to visit relatives. We stayed at Grandma Jinx's house, and I was able to play with my cousin George for a few days. On one of the days we stayed in England, my mother's sister, Aunt Min, and my grandma Ma came to visit and brought me a lot of English chocolates which I relished. All in all, it was a good trip and I was glad to be able to experience it, though the length of the trip cut into my school schedule, and I missed a couple of weeks of school. After the holiday season, my nanny Christine had to leave back to Germany, and this saddened me deeply. Christine would always be my favorite nanny, and I was in a sullen mood on the day she left. The remainder of my third grade year went by quickly. I continued my Pokemon endeavors, increasing my card collection and progressing on the Game Boy game. I had a conflict with my friend Shane during this time. Because of some arguments we previously had, I started to play a game with him in which he would become my enemy and rival at the school. For me, I was just playing with him, but he took it seriously and... Notice that, like, every kid he meets is his arch enemy. He's already had, like, three or four arch enemies at the age of, like, in fourth grade. Unironic arch enemies, too. Seriously, and the conflict escalated a lot more than I thought it would. We once got into a small physical fight in which I hit him on the arm and was sent to the principal's office. That was the biggest trouble I'd been in at Topanga Elementary. 
This little conflict with Shane lasted for the rest of third grade, but we would later reconcile and play again as friends in fourth grade. Before summer came, my father's spontaneous career as a commercial director took off once again, and he became very successful. At this point, he was probably the most successful he's ever been. With this success, he decided to move to a bigger and better house. After a doing bigger some searching, and we moved to a house in the upscale area of like West it. Hills, near Woodland Hills. I loved this house at first sight. It had five bedrooms, which was more than enough space for our family along with Uncle Dan who was still staying with us. It also had a huge swimming pool with a spa, a large grass field to play in, a basketball court, and a nice view of the valley. I was a valley kid again. Despite father's move to a much larger house and all the benefits that came with it, I still preferred my time in mother's house, just because of her gentle and fun attitude and the energy of her household. Mm. My mother indulged in me more than my father no male influences. ever did. She knew what I liked None. and what I didn't like, and she would go out of her way to make my life pleasant and enjoyable. That is a fucking creepy way of putting it. My mother knew what I liked and what I didn't like. If only the women I later met in my life knew what I liked and I didn't like, things would have turned out the way they did. Enjoyable. I was quite annoyed with the recent decision between my mother and father to extend my stay at father's by two days of the week. From that point on, me and my sister would only be at mother's house from Monday to Thursday, and on Thursday night we would go to father's house until the following Monday. My 90th birthday was spent at father's house, and father and Sumai threw a party for me. They invited a few of my friends from Topanga Elementary, though the only friend I remember being there was Philip and his younger brother Jeffrey. James was invited, but he wasn't able to make it. They also invited a few of George's friends, which really annoyed me. Since his father will later George's, offer to buy It was quite an eventful party, and it took place in our backyard. Which I think My father something. hired a magician to perform tricks for everyone, nine years old. That's my like something they do in fucking And I went through a lot of changes emotionally and intellectually. That's what Tyrion was the year which I matured to a point where I would start observing the world more conscientiously. Before I turned nine, I was living life as a carefree child in a world that I thought was only good and pure. From this point onwards, I would gradually discover more about the world and society. I would face problems and frustrations that I wouldn't even think about before. My life would still be positive and bright, however, and I would live it to its fullest. The first frustration of the year, which would remain for the rest of my life, was the fact that I was very short for my age. As fourth grade started, it fully dawned on me that I was the shortest kid in my class even the girls were taller than me. In the past, I rarely gave a thought to it, but at this stage I became extremely annoyed at how everyone was taller than me, and how the tallest boys were automatically Man respected more. Rage. It instilled the first Man feelings of inferiority in me, and such feelings would only grow more volatile with time. I desperately wanted to get taller, and I read that playing basketball increases height. This sparked my brief interest in basketball, and I would play it all the time during recess and lunch in the upper. Most of the basketball courts were unused, so I would play it by myself, or with anyone who cared to join me. During my time at Father's, I would spend hours playing basketball at Father's basketball court, shooting, hoop after hoop long into the evening, and I also remember lying on the ground in the basketball court trying to stretch my body as much as I could in between basketball sessions. When I played basketball at school, some boys would join me, and when they did I saw that they were much better at the sport than me. I envied their ability to throw the ball at double the distance than I could. I think... This made me realize that along with guys, being short. Guys, I'm thinking about this as we're reading through this. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has this. Uh, it could just be me. I could just be crazy. But I feel like there might be a little bit of an unreliable narrator here who might have made some of this stuff up when he was writing this autobiography or fill in some blanks. Uh, I don't know. It could be. Short. I was we'll physically to compared to other boys more. my age. Even boys younger than me were stronger. This vexed me to no end. My fourth grade classroom was located in the center area of the school, and my teacher was named Mrs. Gill, who had an assistant named M.R. Divine. Fourth grade was a strange year due to the emotional problems I would go through, and I didn't have as much fun at school as I did in previous years. In class, I sat near Keaton Weber, and I got into a few conflicts with him. We weren't quite enemies, but I disliked him intensely and I would always consider him a foul brick. By nature, I am a very jealous person, and at the age of nine my jealous name. I just have to say, fuck you, Keenan Weaver. You were the sixth arch enemy by the time he was nine. He had like six arch enemies. What the fuck is up with that? <coughs> I don't know. Jealous nature sprung to the surface. During playdates <coughs> with James, sometimes he would have other friends over as well, and I would feel very good <coughs> when he paid more attention to them. Feeling left out, I would find a quiet corner and start crying. My mother and Kim were very understanding, and did the best they could to console me. On the rare occurrence that my mother would have Maddie and Mo over for dinner, or if we would go to visit them at their house, Maddie often played with my little sister Georgia instead of me, and this too made me jealous. I remember all the times I cried when this happened, jealousy and envy. Those are two feelings that would dominate my entire life and bring me immense pain. The feelings of jealousy I felt at nine years old were frustrating, but they were nothing compared to how I would feel once I hit puberty and have to watch girls choosing other boys over me. Any problem I had at nine years old was nirvana compared to what I was doomed to face. A few months into fourth grade, it was decided by my parents to change me and my sister's living arrangement yet again. This time, we would be switching between mother's house and father's house each week. One week would be spent at mother's, and the next at father's. This was a fair split. At first, I wasn't so sure about it, because I always disliked any change to my life, but I found it to be a better arrangement. 
This enabled me to spend weekends at mother's house during her week, and I was very excited about this. I've only ever spent weekends at father's beforehand. During father's week, I would mostly be looked after by our two new nannies, Rosa and Ampero. They were of South American origin and didn't speak much English, but they were very kind. I started to have intense conflicts with Somalia. I hated the rules she imposed on me, which I believed she had no right to impose, as she wasn't my true parent. I actually agree. Fuck Sumania. Fuck her Arab ass. She had no right to tell the Raj what to do. No one has any right to tell the Raj what to do. Or else they're gonna have to dodge the Raj. Parent. I hated how she would force me to drink milk every morning and very foul tasting soup for dinner. I made such a fuss about having the soup that she used it as a punishment. Whenever I did something wrong, she would force me to drink the soup. I once had a play date with Philip if- Okay, this is so fucked up. Okay, so... She made this awful tasting soup and forced him to drink it. That is so fucked. Philip at father's house, and when I yelled at my sister because she was annoying us, Somalia punished me by sending me to my room for an hour, embarrassing me in front of Philip. After this incident, I never had a play date at father's house ever again. This conflict with Somalia started a trend in which I would love being at mother's house and dread the weeks I had to spend at father's house. On top of the conflicts with Somalia, father was rarely there, as he was always out of town for his work. After spending a nice week at mother's house, I would cry when Sunday came and I had to go to father's on Monday. I would then spend the entire week at father's house looking forward to going back to my mother's. I remember those Mondays when my mother dropped me off at school for the first day of father's week. I felt so sad that I cried when I saw my mother's car driving away. Of course, I would hide the tears to avoid embarrassment at school, but I would feel miserable for that whole day. I always- Honestly, I can't really blame him. Like, his, so his father's never around. His father, as you may have noticed, is just not involved in his life at all. Um, he just keeps abandoning him. So he has to spend half the week with some thought from Morocco, who he barely knows, who fucking does weird shit to him, like forcing him to drink this some disgusting Arab stew. I can't really blame him for getting upset. I'd probably cry as a kid, too, if I was going through this. And, I don't know, people can attack me for sympathizing with the Raj on this one, but, eh, I can kind of understand where he's coming from. I always had a pleasant experience during Mother's Week. She always arranged playdates for me, because she knew I was too shy to initiate them myself. She always made everything fun. On weekends after- Now, the thing is, the soup was cool, but one of the things Elliot Rogers did, which he doesn't mention, is... His father found him, and he had, he had cut open a, a pregnant cat. He cut up cut open his sister's pregnant cat to see what the babies looked like on the inside. And after he cut open the pregnant cat to see what the um, the kittens looked like on the inside, his father found him, and his father beat the shit out of him. And then his Asian mother um, said, "If you ever do that again, I'm gonna cut off your balls in your sleep." And that was the first and last time that Elliot Rodgers was ever punished for anything. And that's how he turned out to be uh, the psycho he is. Weekends after dinner, we would have treat time, where she would bring out a box of candies for me and my sister to choose from. I had a lot of playdates with Philip, and through Philip I also played with his brother Jeffrey, who was two years younger than us. While Philip was calm and mature, Jeffrey was the complete opposite. Jeffrey Blozer was wild and boisterous, which often brought a lot of fun to my playdates with Philip. My mother once had a party at her house and invited all of our family friends. James Ellis came over, and so did Philip and Jeffrey. It was the first time I saw all of them together, and it made for an interesting experience. I got a bit jealous, however, when Philip and Jeffrey seemed to respect and pay more attention to James than they did to me. When we were playing on my Nintendo 64 and I was competing against James, they rooted for James, which really upset me. As my fourth grade year of Fuck you, ten, James! My nine-year-old self had another revelation about how the world works. I realized that there were hierarchies, that some people were better than others. Of course, I was subconsciously aware of this in the past, but it was at this time of my life at nine years old that I started to give it a lot of thought and importance. I started to see this at school. At school, they were always the cool kids who seemed to be more admirable than everyone else. The way they looked, dressed, and acted made them cooler. These cool kids, as I called them, included Keaton Weber. The fact that I was super rich, and, and my father was famous, and I was descended from a long line of British nobility, didn't mean I was privileged. The other kids were all privileged. I was never privileged. I love how much of this book is just him and his arch nemesis. He has so many fucking arch nemesis. Like half this book is just him yelling "fuck you" and some random Weber, kids. Matt Warner, Michael May, Trevor, <coughs> John, Ross, John, Joe, Glenn, and a few more. They were cool. They were popular, and they always seemed like they were having a good time. The peaceful and innocent. Frenemies. The Elliot Rogers story. Was all over. The time of fair play was at its end. 
Life is a competition and a struggle, and I was slowly starting to realize it. When I became aware of this common social structure at my school, I also started to examine myself and compare myself to these cool kids. I realized, with some horror, that I wasn't cool at all. I had a dorky hairstyle, I wore plain and uncool clothing, and I was shy and unpopular. I was always described as the shy boy in the past, but I never really thought my shyness would affect me in a negative way, until this point. This revelation about the world, and about myself, really decreased my self-esteem. On top of this was the feeling that I was different because I am of mixed race. I am half white, half Asian, and this made me different from the normal fully white kids that I was trying to fit in with. I envied the cool kids, and I wanted to be one of them. I was a bit frustrated at my parents for not shaping me into one of these kids in the past. They never made an effort to dress me in stylish clothing or get me a good-looking haircut. I had to make every effort to rectify this. I had to adapt. My first act was to ask my parents to allow me to bleach my hair blonde. I always envied and admired blonde-haired people, they always seemed so much more beautiful. My parents agreed to let me do it, and father took me to a hair salon on Mulholland Drive in Woodland Hills. Choosing the hair salon was a bad decision, for they only bleached the top of my head blonde. When I indignantly questioned why they didn't make all of my hair blonde, they said that I was too young for a full bleaching. I was furious. I thought I looked so silly with blonde hair at the top of my head and black hair at the sides and back. I dreaded going to school the next day with this weird new hair. When I arrived at school the next day, I was intensely nervous. Before class started, I stood in a corner frantically trying to figure out how I would go about revealing this to everyone. Trevor was the first one to notice it, and he came up to me and patted my head, saying that it was very cool. Well, that was exactly what I wanted. My new hair turned out to be quite Fuck a- Fuck you, and Trevor! Days, I got a hint of the attention and admiration I so craved. My interest in Pokemon faded away at this time. In third grade, Pokemon was considered cool and everyone was playing it. Towards the end of fourth grade, I found out that everyone was growing out of Pokemon, and the only ones who played it were the geeky kids. I heard some kids joking about how lame Pokemon players were, and I decided it was time to quit. I talked to James about this. He was still interested in Pokemon, so I gave him my Charizard card as a gift, and as an act of my resignation from the game. Pokemon gave me some really happy and memorable Who experiences. Who says resignation that age? I then started That's to notice that all of the weird. cool kids were interested in skateboarding. I had never even ridden on a skateboard before, but if I wanted to be cool, I had to become a skateboarder. I expressed this to my parents, and my father was glad that I was showing an interest in an active sport. He took me to the Snorvel Surf on Ventura Boulevard to buy me a new skateboard, and I was fascinated by all of the different choices. I settled for a Redvel Surf branded skateboard, and they took it down from the wall and built it for me. I was thrilled to have this new skateboard and the possible chance it gave me to be a cool kid. It was time to start practicing. I found it very hard to even ride on it in the beginning, and I spent many hours outside trying to get the hang of it. And that was that, I was now a skateboarder, though not yet good enough to reveal myself as one to the kids at school. This was the start of an obsession to copy everything the supposed cool kids were doing. Part 3, the last period of contentment, age 9 to 13, fourth grade ended, and once the summer started, I took a vow to mold myself into the coolest kid I could possibly be by the time- I took a ended. vow! I anticipate- To become the coolest kid ever. I would. I would become so cool that all others would envy me. Anticipated the approval the other cool kids would have of me once I reveal myself as being similar to them, and I looked forward to it. After about a year and a half of living in the house on Hatter Street, in Upper West Hills, my father decided to move into an even better house. This time, all of us started moving like and opening houses together as a family. How many we times real is this like and examined some beautiful seven? homes around Woodland Hills. My favorite one was a three-story house on Lano Drive in the Woodland Hills Heights, the most prestigious area of Woodland Hills that bordered Canada. It coolest. didn't have a pool, but it had a sloping backyard like no almost three times as large as our current one. The house had six bedrooms, do, and I took an intense liking to one particular bedroom purpose. that had its own bathroom and a personal balcony. My father showed extreme enthusiasm about possibly buying this house, and I became obsessed with getting that particular bedroom as my own room. When I brought it up with father and Sumania, they said that the room would most likely be George's because it was closer to the master bedroom. They Fuck you, Georgia! She stole this house twice. Balcony. I was stole his room twice. And I a huge crying tantrum. Soon enough, the father went room. ahead with the decision to buy this house. I made a big deal about the possibility of not getting that lovely bedroom I wanted, and I kept talking to father and Sumania about it. When they finally moved and the first week of fathers at this new house started, I was very anxious. But then, as we entered, father and Sumaya surprised me and revealed that they decided to give me the room I wanted. I was so happy. I danced and leaped with joy all over the house, and then I went to my new bedroom. It was the new first and last happy thing that ever happened. happened. After the move to this new house, it was the only time I ever again, felt any affection for day. my parents. I would have many important experiences there for the next decade, both good and terrible. I needed a skateboard for mother's house too, and so my mother took me to Vail Surf and bought me a gray Vail Surf skateboard. Why I would use a skateboard much more than the red skateboard I had at Father's house, since I had all of my playdates during Mother's week, and Mother would make more of an effort to indulge in my new interest, eventually taking me to scatter parks every weekend. I became very excited about my new hobby, and I shared it with James Ellis and Philip Blozer, my two main friends. I wanted to get them interested in skateboarding as well. It was tricky to get James into it, but he soon got his own skateboard, and we would start skateboarding together around his neighborhood. As I now considered myself a skateboarder, I wanted to dress in the clothes that all the cool skateboarders were wearing. My mother took me to Vail Surf once again, this time to shop for new shirts. I picked out a few that had the logos of skateboard companies on them. Later that day I put on one of my new shirts, and I was thrilled to start going around in it. I felt cool. At father's house, I was introduced to a new nanny who would be living with us. 
Rosa and Impera left back to their home countries a few months before we moved house. This new nanny was an African-American woman named Tracy. She had a very fun personality, and I always had a pleasant time when she looked after us. She was able to drive, unlike my previous nannies, and so she would be the one who would always pick me up from school during father's week from that point on. Uncle Dan had a quarrel with my father, and he was forced to move out. I would never see him again after that. Tracy would, in a way, replace Uncle Dan as the lodger who would live at father's house. Early in the summer, father forced me to attend summer camp at an elementary school nearby our new house. This school was Bay Laurel Elementary School in Calabasas. I hated the prospect, and I vehemently protested it. The last thing I wanted to do was spend my coveted summer at a school where I didn't know anyone. I was starting to like going to father's house a lot more after moving to our lovely new house with my exquisite new room. But this decision of father's made me dislike my weeks there again. At mother's house, I had it my way more often, and that's how I wanted to live. I hated having to go to camp during the summer, and I was miserable at the start. But a couple weeks into it I made friends with two with two brothers named Thomas and Tyler. On Mother's Week, I spent more and more time practicing skateboarding, and I had lots of playdates with James where we would skateboard together. We also had a lot of fun playing the Nintendo 64 games, such as Donkey Kong 64, Banjo Kazoo, Banjo 2, James Bond Goldeneye, and many more. He also got me interested in collecting Beanie Babies. <coughs> At first, I thought such a thing was very lame and girly, but we used them to fuel our imagination and have mock battles and wars with each other. It was our secret hobby that we told no one about. I was relieved when summer camp ended, and once it was over my 10th birthday arrived. I had been on this world for a decade, and what a decade it was. Full, Full of, of discovery, discovery fun, fun. happy adventures. I, I couldn't say the same for the following decade. My 10th birthday, and I believe I celebrated it during Mother's Week. We went out with James and his family to a restaurant in the Palisades. Ten years old, I was eager to re-bleach my hair to a fully blonde color. After the disastrous failure of my previous attempt, this time, Sumaya took me to the right salon, and they gave me a short haircut and bleached all of my hair blonde. When I looked at myself in the mirror, I felt an intense level of satisfaction. I went to James's house soon after I acquired my new hair color, and the look of surprise on his face when he first saw me gave me a good laugh. A couple of weeks later, my hair started to grow and my black hair would show at the roots, but the blend turned out to suit me well, and this would become my hairstyle for the next year. Mother took me and my sister on a short vacation towards the end of the summer. We drove up the 101 freeway to Ventura, where we stayed at the Holiday Inn, which has now been replaced by the Crown Plaza. I found the hotel to be comfortable and luxurious. It was located right on the Ventura. The Holiday Inn, a beautiful walkway along the beach that led to a long okay, At the stage, I was very enthusiastic about my new interest in skateboarding, and I took my skateboard with me. I enjoyed practicing on my new skateboard all along the Ventura Promenade. During this trip, Mother took me to my first skate park, which was called Skate Street. It was humongous, and I was awed by all the towering ramps. I attended a beginning <coughs> class, and the instructor taught me the basics of riding on these ramps. I was absolutely terrified at first, but by the end of the class, I was able to go up and down the smallest of them, and I had a blast. When we got back to the hotel, we had a nice room service dinner, and then the three of us watched the movie Finding Nemo on the hotel television. It was a lovely little trip. Before fifth grade started, I went with my father and Sumana to a dinner party at their friend's house. I forgot who these friends were, but it was a nice house in Beverly Hills. There were lots of guests, and I did what I usually did at such dinner parties. I sat around eating snacks and talked with my sister, sometimes going to father and ask for a sip of wine. During this party, I found myself having a conversation with father, Sumaya, and one of the party guests, a boisterous middle-aged man who I can't recall the name of. Father and Sumaya were talking about how I just turned 10 years old, and we discussed life and what the future had in store for me. This man we were talking to. He patted me on the back and told me that I have a great life ahead of me. With a grin on his face, he told me that in the next 10 years, you'll have a great time. A great time. I had no idea what he meant by that. I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking, thinking about my about future, my point. and I knew I it would be alone. awful now like everything else. Childhood is fun, but when a boy reaches puberty a whole new world opens up to him. A whole new world with new pleasures, such as sex and love. Other boys will experience this, but not me. It pains me to say. That is the basis of my tragic life. I will not have a great time in the next ten years. The pleasures of sex and love will be denied to me. Other boys will experience it, but not me. Not Instead, me. I will only experience misery, Everybody rejection, me. loneliness, and pain. At that moment in time, I didn't think much about this man. I had to rot. I don't even remember who he was. But after loneliness. those ten years have passed and I've experienced what I've experienced, I can't help but think about that moment. If only I knew what was in store for me, right then and there. It was time to begin fifth grade. It started out excellently. My teacher was named Mrs. Demart, and she would always be very kind to me. For the first week of fifth grade, I was at mother's house. I considered myself to be very cool by now. I had gotten better at skateboarding, I had blonde hair, and I dressed like a skateboarder. I felt great anticipation for what the cool kids would think of me once they saw my transformation. To my disappointment, no one really cared. Would we anybody ever worlds. think Elliot Rogers was cool? Recognition of my new I just can't see Eventually, that ever happening. I was regarded differently than I was in fourth grade, which I became content with. The cool kids talked to me more, and I started hanging out with them during recess and lunch. When Father's Week came, I felt frustrated because I didn't have enough cool clothes there, and it took a while for me to get Father to find the time to buy some for me. Mother always got me what I wanted, right when I wanted it. Mother and gave me house, everything I wanted. With excellent precision, whereas at Father's house, there would always be a time delay because Father and Samaya had less time for me, and paid less attention to me. Shortly after my fifth grade year began, my mother decided to move out of the Red House to a small house in Woodland Hills. This new house was located Another on the house? Boulevard, near Dunnett Street. 
how Thomas house was just up the hill from there. Uh, I so should have been walking distance counting to Thomas how many times house. I house, despite its smallness and it is what it is. Share a room with my sister. I had some very good times there. This new house was more convenient. It was still a two bedroom house, but one room was big enough to be split into. And so by having a wall built in the middle, my sister and I each got our own room. As I got better and better at skateboarding, my mother made an effort to take me to a skate park every week. By now, skateboarding wasn't just a sport I was doing to copy the cool kids. I was truly interested in the sport. I even had hopes and dreams of becoming a professional skateboarder. Yeah, like that became that was my life goal. I loved skateboarding so much. I pictured myself doing amazing tricks in front of a cheering crowd, just like I saw Tony Hawk do in some videos. I pictured the admiration on their faces, and it was awesome. The skate park my Elliot Rogers, was Northridge Skate Park, Tony and she Hawk. would take me there every Friday. Northridge Skate Park was an average-sized outdoor skate park with fine wooden ramps. First, we would have dinner at the Northridge Mall, and then I would sign up for the 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. session at the Skate Park. I usually went alone, but after a few weeks of going, I made a few acquaintances there, and people knew me. This became a Friday tradition during Mother's Week. On the following Saturday, James usually came over for a sleepover. We would play Nintendo 64 games like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Donkey Kong late into the night, and then on Sunday morning, Mother would take us both to Skate Lab, an indoor skate park in Simi Valley. James had become really interested in skateboarding too, or so I believed. I was always better at it than him though, and I liked it that way. This was the way Fuck you, James! I was, I was better than you! I was better than you at this one thing! For Halloween. My costume, of course, was myself as a skateboarder. We went to the Lemelsons for a nice dinner and then set out to collect our candy. It Who the fuck go- like, what does- What? Goes for a, a skate? Skateboard? I, I don't know. None of it makes any sense. I, I, I don't understand how you- I know one guy who put on jeans when he went for Halloween, and he said, "I'm a, I'm a hacker," and that's how he described himself. That was his costume. Candy. It was quite tricky to hold a bag full of candy while skateboarding, but I had fun. I remember some teenagers seeing me on my skateboard and saying, "Why didn't I think of that?" Ha! Huh, that was gratifying. For Christmas, my mother bought me the new PlayStation 2. I had been wanting it for a long time, and when I unwrapped the present and saw the box, I felt so elated. Beforehand, the only video game console I played was the Nintendo 64, and the Game Boy, if that counts. The PlayStation 2 was much more advanced in graphics, and it amazed me. When Mother announced that I would have to share it with my sister Georgia and that I can't keep it in my room, my excitement turned to indignation, and I threw quite a tantrum. After crying for a bit, I calmed down and settled to sharing it with Georgia. She wouldn't be using it much anyways. I, I told, told myself, myself, even after getting a PlayStation 2, I still played my Nintendo 64 a lot because I loved the games I had for it, and I had an emotional attachment to it. The Nintendo 64 was the first video game console I played, and it would always have a special place in my heart. One day during winter break at father's house, father and it son would be really funny few... if he if this turned into him just talking about Super Mario 64, and then he goes online and has an argument with Movie Bob about the merits of Super Mario 64 versus Mario 3, and they both like kill each other, like fighting with controllers or like with keyboards. <coughs> few hours and left me and my sister with Tracy. When they came back, they had a little puppy with him, and announced that it was our new pet. It was mainly a present for Georgia. Georgia had been desperately asking father for a pet puppy for the last year, but I didn't think he would actually go through with it. I was so shocked that we now had a dog. I was always afraid of dogs when I was little, and I of never course, imagined he's afraid of everything. Pet. The only pets I've had previously were my turtle and iguana, who both died within a year of acquiring them. Georgia was given Probably a just didn't name feed the them because he was such a fucking narcissist. I thought this was a very lame and stupid name. Like, the turtle was, like, starving, and, the and he's like, fuck you, turtle! I don't want to feed you now, you selfish bastard. You fucking sit there all day and have people love you. You have girls say you're cute. Why the fuck can't I be a turtle that fucking starve you to death for the crime of having a better life than me? When I returned to school after the winter break, <coughs> the kids had another interest, hacky sacking. It was a simple sport consisting of kicking a bean sack into the air as many times as you can without it landing on the floor. <coughs> They all had hacky sacks, and they would spend recess and lunch kicking them with each other, since skateboarding wasn't allowed on school grounds. I didn't have a hacky sack, and I decided that I needed to do something about that. Mother took me to the store pack sun where I got a hacky sack with an orange and green design. When we got home from the mall, I started practicing. I remember struggling with it first, but I spent the next few afternoons concentrating on getting good at it. I spent many hours well into the night practicing in my backyard. Once I was able to kick the hacky sack properly, I made a big deal of the fact that I was now interested in it. I would go up to the group of cool kids and show off my skills, and I played with it every single minute I spent outside during school time. The upper playground was rebuilt over the break, and there was a brand new playground to play on. I always loved brand new things, and the new playground was quite engaging. On the very first day that we were allowed to use it, I played tag with Philip Bloser, Addison Elkendorf, Bryce Jacobs, and a few others. I never really became good friends with the so-called cool kids. I would see them more as competitors than friends. 
During recess and lunch, I mainly played with Philip and his little clique, which consisted of Addison Eltendorf, Kevin, and TJ Tassoni. I made a few fourth grade friends. How does he Sunday, remember all these people's names. names? I mainly played with them during recess and lunch. I don't fucking know. One day, after I stayed an hour after school, upper, I was hacking with them and I kicked my hacky sense. sack up onto a roof. It wasn't first hacky sack, thank goodness, but I was quite fond of it and I was sad to lose it. I wonder if it's still up there. No, it would have been cleared away by now. I still refuse to have any playdates when I was at my father's house due to the incident with Sumaya in fourth grade. Because of this, my father and Sumaya became concerned that I didn't have any friends. Sumaya forced me to befriend some of the neighbor's kids who lived just down the road. They would often skateboard outside of their houses. I was aghast. The prospect of walking up to a bunch of kids who I didn't know and asking to play with them was terrifying to me. They were cool skateboarders, and that made it even more intimidating. Of course, I wanted to be friends with them and join in their fun, but I was too scared that they would think I'm weird. I have always been shy. Well, you are fucking weird. didn't understand this, and she You're a narcissistic psycho. She sent me out of the house and wouldn't let me back in until I introduced myself to them. I tried pretending that I was playing with them, but instead I was <laughs> <having a> <laughs> <street> <laughs> <with> her. <laughs> to my surprise, Sumana somehow knew I was doing this, and she came to confront me. She then got Tracy to take me down to where the kids were playing and push me into it. Tracy went up to the kids and asked if I could play with them. I felt embarrassed and timid, but they welcomed me. I always had the subconscious preconception that the coolest kids were mean and aggressive by nature, which is quite true, and I was shocked that these kids were being nice to me and letting me play with them. After a fun afternoon skateboarding around the streets of Woodland Hills, I regretted not befriending them sooner. They went to Woodland Hills Elementary School, the school my sister would soon go to. A couple of weeks later, Sumana forced me to befriend yet another group of Woodland Hills kids. The second group lived nearer to my house, and they weren't skateboarders, however they liked riding bikes and scooters. One of them was a black boy named Lucky Radley, who I thought was very nice at the time. I found it strange that he had the same name as my dog. He was a fourth grader, and he would later go to the same middle school as me, where he would become an object. What kind of fucking parent names their son Lucky? This is fucking Swippletopia. I don't know. I don't know what kind of asshole names their, their child that. It's... I, I, I don't know. Object of my extreme jealousy and hatred. Looking back, I can't believe I actually played with him as a friend in my father's neighborhood. In the spring, Uncle Johnny and the cousins came to stay at father's house. Cousin George bunked with me in my room, and the two of us became instant friends. I hadn't seen him since my last trip to England, and back then we were little kids. I enjoyed having a friend to play with on a daily basis without having to arrange a play date, and the week that they stayed with us was great fun. I once took him along to play on scooters and skateboards with the neighbor kids, and we also went to the beach a lot. Indeed, it was a great week, and I was sad to see them go. I looked forward to seeing him again when we were to go on our vacation to France and England in the coming summer. After Johnny and the cousins left, Sumana's mother Khadija came to stay for a few months, and I was made to share my room with her, because father had converted two of the guest rooms into his office, and Tracy was staying in the downstairs room. I had an extra bed in my room, so I suppose it made sense to them. I was a bit annoyed with this at the start, but I bonded well with Khadija, so I soon became okay with it. She was like a third grandmother to me. My mother attained tickets to the red carpet premiere Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. We received four tickets. Georgia was old enough to go, and I persuaded Mother to let me give the fourth ticket to James. I was awestruck by the time the movie ended. It found it to be absolutely phenomenal. James and I talked about it for hours afterward. My life at school was starting to become mediocre again, and I became frustrated with my struggle to be cool. I didn't have a regular group of friends who I always played with. I was like a nomad, moving from group to group and trying to fit in with each one. Like a Sega nomad. Reading. I feared that the cool kids didn't regard me as one of them, and even Phillips could never considered me one of their core friends. Despite all of my attempts to be cool, I didn't feel as if the other kids respected me as such. I was still quite the outcast, as I always will be. My social life changed so I will Mrs. always be an outcast. In arrangements in class. Everybody hated me. On who sits where was Everybody was mean Our to me. Our class consisted of tables that seated about kill. five to six people, and when our name was called randomly, we could choose from where to sit, meaning that everyone had a chance to sit with their group of friends. I didn't have a core group of friends, so I was thrown into a state of panic. Originally, I was sitting at the table where Phillips Click sat, but all of their names were called before me, and I was booted from their table. At this point, I just chose to sit anywhere, and I ended up sitting next to John Joe Glenn. Matt Bordier and Danny Dahani also sat at our table. These were kids who I regarded as cool, so I was content with sitting with them. I never really interacted with John Joe Glenn that much in the past. He was one of the biggest jerks of the school, next to Trevor and Keaton. We quarreled a bit at the start, but soon enough we started socializing, and I talked with him about some new games I got for my PlayStation 2. We became friends when John Joe suddenly asked me if he can come over to my house. I felt happy that he asked me this. It would be the first play date I would have without my mother arranging it for me. Fuck you, John Joe. You're another detractor. That's why I'm going to start calling the John Arch enemies detractors. Despite my struggles to be regarded as cool and my obsession with attaining such recognition, fifth grade was my favorite school year in elementary school. I played with more people than I ever did in previous grades. I was less shy, I wasn't a dork, and I had an awesome time learning how to skateboard and hack you sack. It was a memorable year filled with joyful experiences. I didn't want the school year to end. Once fifth grade was over, I will have to go to middle school, and the prospect filled me with anxiety. My little innocent mind always looked at middle school as something far in the future, when I grew up. I didn't want to grow up. I was enjoying my life as a kid right at that moment. 
I didn't think about the future. Kids in my class told many rumors of middle school life that filled me with fear and sent a shiver through my spine. Even through watching movies and TV shows I got a glimpse of what was in store for a middle schooler. There was talk of girls, and how it would soon be cool to be popular with the girls. Girls were like completely foreign creatures to me. I never interacted with them. I wasn't expected to. In elementary school, boys played with boys and girls played with girls. That was what I was used to. That was my world. I heard stories of how boys that were expected was my to kissing girls in middle school. That was my Such things overwhelmed me. Twisted I tried world. to dismiss it as much as I could and enjoy my life in the present moment. My school arranged a camping trip for the entire fifth grade class before graduation day. At first, I didn't want to go because I would be away from my parents for five days, something I was never used to. I was afraid I would get too homesick. I never spent more than one night away from my parents. On the rare occasion that they had to go out of town for a few days and left me with a nanny, I would cry at night. My teacher, Mrs. Daymark, came up to me one morning before class started and persuaded me to go, saying that the graduation trip was something I wouldn't want to miss. It would be a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and after some hesitation I agreed to go along. I forgot exactly where this camping trip took place. It was located at a special camping retreat somewhere in the forest to the north of Los Angeles. It was very secluded. A small village of cabins and tents surrounded by wilderness and hiking trails. For the trip there, I decided to go with my friends Bryce and Charlie in a car instead of taking the school bus with everyone else. This was much more comfortable, and I was glad to have snagged a spot in the car with them. Everyone was assigned to groups of five to share a cabin or a tent. I was originally placed in the group with Charlie, Bryce, and a few others. But that group was given a tent to sleep in. I was appalled by how drab and uncomfortable the tents looked. I wanted a cabin. So I went to my teacher and asked to be transferred to a group that was sleeping in a cabin. She placed me in a group of some cool skateboarder kids, including Michael. She Sam, placed Hope, me in a group Matt, with some Stephen. cool skateboarders. I felt a sense of pride to be part of this group. I was During one the daytime of the cool on this kids trip, the whole fifth grade class participated again. in games, outdoor activities, nature hikes, and barbecues. It was great fun. Nighttime in the cabin was like having a sleepover with five people, and it was a new experience that excited me. It was Before great bedtime, fun. Michael Ray took Little did I know that it too would and all of the boys would become part and of them. So, of my even at the early age of ten, boys word. were starting to be attracted to the female body. I didn't understand this. I hadn't yet Who reached the that fuck stage. The I pretended body. to be interested just so that I wouldn't hear uncool. Really all of those boys probably lost their virginity by 16. Damn them. The trip ended up being so fun that I didn't cry at all about being away from my parents for so long. And finally, it was time to graduate from elementary school. Before the ceremony, our whole class watched a video full of footage of school life throughout the year. I saw a few glimpses of myself caught in the footage, and I felt gratified. My life at Topanga Elementary School was a blast, full of memorable experiences and wonderful times. I dressed in a nice shirt with a tie for the ceremony. All of the fifth graders lined up and walked down an aisle through the center of the auditorium, with the audience of parents and siblings on either side. When I saw my parents, they looked so proud of me. Each student had to walk up to their teacher the on the stage and receive It was the last time that they would ever be proud of me. It was before they realized what a, what a failure their son was. They realized that their son was, was not one of the cool kids. Because my parents were, were both cool kids, even though they were adults. Because adults can't be cool kids. That's what I learned, that that adults could be cool kids, and that is just a small part of my twisted world. Required to give a speech, to my relief. I would be too nervous to talk in front of an audience. The graduation theme song was Time of Your Life by the band Green Day, one of my favorite bands. That was the fucking, like, song at everyone's... If you grew up in the 90s or 2000s, the graduation song of every single time has been yeah has been that uh, has been time of your life graduation from fifth yeah i agree that's freaking weird i've never heard of that before bands whenever i would hear the song again i would think about the glorious day and the memories would make me feel an extreme sense of nostalgia in the afternoon there was a graduation party at the top of topanga community recreation center a lovely place that provided a view of the whole valley my mother took me to have dinner at the sushi restaurant kabuki afterwards it was just me and her as we sat down at the restaurant, it was kabuki, all the excitement, I took just a like my life. The fact that elementary school was all over, it was done. I felt so accomplished and proud. I was happy. Things were good. But along with the happiness was a feeling of sadness that I will be leaving all of those experiences behind. A whole chapter of my life had just passed, and a new one was beginning. That day was such an extraordinary day. A day to remember, a memory to cherish. The new part of my life was beginning, and that part of my life was part of my twisted world. Cherish. For the first few weeks of summer, Mother arranged playdates with various friends and acquaintances I made from Topanga Elementary, including Trevor Burgett, Matt Bordier, Charlie Converse, John Joe Glenn, and Philip Blozer. It was interesting to have all Trevor of them would become over. my friends. I never thought I would have playdates with them. Eventually, Matt was one of the coolest kids in the school. He was a skateboarder and a baseball player who seemed to garner respect from everyone. I envied him during elementary school, even when we were we friends, and I would deeply en envy and hate him faster. later on in life when I find out how much success he would have with girls. Again, I. Okay, let's see here. Uh, who is this? 
Uh, Trevor, Matt. Fuck you, Matt. You were another one of my frenemies. You were another one of the people who were guilty of living a better life than me. Okay, for those of you who wonder what I'm referring to, there's a part where he literally yelled, uh, like in one of his videos, where he said that you were guilty of living, of having a better life than me. Like, he's so autistic and so insane that he literally views uh, having a better life than him as a crime. I repeat that as children, we all play together as equals in a family. <coughs> Only after the advent of puberty does the true brutality of human nature show its face. No, that's Life not true at all. Kids are fucking all because girls terrible. Choose some boys over others. Kids are all sociopaths. Boys girls find attractive they're, they're, pleasure -filled lives kids while they are terrible. Kids are terrible. Kids are terrible. They're worse than adults the life of pleasure. in a lot of ways. Girls will throw themselves at him. And I will go on to be rejected and humiliated by girls. At that moment in time, we were just playing together as children, oblivious to the fact that my future will be dark and his will be bright. Life is such a cruel joke. My mother continued to take me to Northridge Skata Park every Friday, and I also attended a skateboard camp at Pedlow Skata Park for a couple of weeks. At this camp I bumped into one of the kids. I played with around father's house. I had been trying very hard to get better at skateboarding, but when I saw that there were boys a lot younger than me who could do more tricks, I realized that I sucked. I was never good at sports or any physical activity, and when I discovered skateboarding, I thought that finally here was a sport that I could excel in and even became a professional at. It crushed me a little inside to see that I was a failure at skateboarding after more than a year of practicing it. I could never master the kickflip or heel flip. All I could do was the ollie jump and ride down a few ramps. I saw eight-year-old boys what at the, the scatter park the ollie jump? Jump. and it made me so angry. Why did I fail at everything I tried? I asked myself. My dreams of becoming a professional skateboarder were over. I felt so defeated. Oh, I mean, people... It's just, like, this is the narcissism here. Lots of people have dreams of doing shit when they're younger. The dream I had for most of my life was to become a psychiatrist, believe it or not. And eventually I, I let go of that and started to do, uh, I don't know, other stuff. But it's it's just like a skateboarder is just such like a bullshit job that people think they're going to be when they're a kid. And like less than 1% of 1% ever does stuff like that. But this guy is just completely incapable of accepting any of this. And yet he claims to like change. Because of this, my interest in skateboarding slowly faded away during the summer. James had recently told me that he was no longer interested in the sport, so I no longer had him to skateboard with anyway. Fuck you, James. Forget about it you for ruined my life James yet again. New house in Malibu. The house was owned by the Lundelsons, and they were staying in it temporarily. <coughs> Mother took us there a few times where I adventured with James in the wilderness area that surrounded the house. We would often go to a small <coughs> place in the Malibu. There was a playground there, with a few shops and restaurants surrounding it. It was time for my 11th birthday. I was at Mother's house and just decided to have a small playdate for my birthday. I invited James over, along with another kid who I had befriended at the Woodland Hills Recreation Center. My mother made a small cake, I blew out the candles, and that was it. I was 11 years old, 2 years old. The trip to France and England began shortly after my birthday. We had been talking about it for a while at father's house, and I was really excited to go. We traveled on Virgin Atlantic Upper Class. I was extremely enthusiastic about this, as I always loved luxury and opulence. We stopped by in England for a couple of days to say hello to Grandma Jinx. The cousins weren't there, they were already in France, so it was a bit boring. When we arrived in France, the feeling of wonder and curiosity swept over me as it always did when I visited a foreign country. The last time I was in France, I was only a few weeks old. This was the first time I was able to truly experience the country. France was a whole different world, and it was a world that I liked. French culture is so exquisite and refined compared to American culture. After booking a couple of rooms at a small inn near the town of Toulouse, we met up with Johnny and the cousins at Aunt Jenny's house. Aunt Jenny is my father's sister, and the last time I saw her was when I lived in England, before the move to America. She had a few kittens in her house that I loved to play with. George and I immediately resumed our friendship that started in the spring. There was Who's a vast forest George area again? surrounding the I house. I can't keep track George of all told these me there were lots of wild boars in the forest, so we went wild boar hunting. It was just a game, and we never ended up seeing any boars at all, but the suspense of possibly finding one was what made it fun. We stayed in Toulouse for about a week, and then we said goodbye to the relatives and set off to tour the country. We toured many cultural towns and stayed in castle-style hotels. What this the should fuck have been is a, a cultural town? For me, but my conflicts with Simona soured it. Like, yeah, there were a few like incidents in, which she punished me by making me stay in my hotel room while she, father, and Georgia all went out to dinner at a restaurant. I hated. Wait a minute. Let me see here. She punished him by making him stay in the room. They spend like tens of thousands of dollars or however much on this trip, and they don't let this kid, like, go out because the Sumia sounds like a fucking bitch. No wonder this kid turned out so bad with his fucking Moroccan thought stepmother. Hated her for this. On the way back, we stopped at Grandma Jinx's house in England for a week. The cousins were there this time, and it was a lot of fun. 
We all slept in one room, so it was like having one big sleepover. One day we went on a trip to a museum, where I had an argument with Samaya. She shouted at me in front of George and threatened to punish me. This was so embarrassing that I fell into a miserable mood for the rest of the day. I always loved traveling, but I learned that traveling with Samaya just ruins the whole experience. And this wouldn't be the last time I would be forced to travel with Samaya either, to my utmost dismay. The trip lasted three weeks in length, the perfect length of time for a vacation, in my opinion. I quite enjoyed it, if I don't count the time Samaya ruined it. It felt nice to be back home after a long, cultural vacation. At father's what house, the fuck is a long cultural an vacation? With father, and she was forced to leave. I was sad to see her go. She was always pleasant and fun to be around. Once Tracy left, Georgia and I would no longer have any nannies. We were getting too old for it. I wasn't a little child anymore. Having nannies became a thing of the past. From now on, if father and Samaya had to go out to a dinner party, they would just hire a babysitter to look after us, and soon I would be old enough to stay by myself in the house. I got a haircut, and this time I decided not to bleach my hair blonde. The black hair always grew out anyway, so the full blonde look only lasted for a couple of weeks. Having blonde hair seemed to have lost its spark, so I just didn't bother with it anymore. The summer was pleasant and relaxing, but it quickly came to an end. The time for middle school had come. My fear of this day haunted the back of my mind all summer. I was enrolled at Pinecrest Middle School for 6th grade. I had mixed feelings about going to the school because I didn't like my experience there during kindergarten. Father said it's the best option for me because it was a small private school. I didn't want to go to a large school like Hale Middle School. That would have been too overwhelming for me. On the first day, I was shaking with anxiety and fear. I didn't know what to expect. Transitioning to middle school was a big deal for me, even more so than starting elementary school. I was much older and I cared more about what people thought of me. I was no longer an innocent little child who didn't have to worry. I had to worry about a lot of things. I had and to worry I about worry. how twisted my world would They all previously went to come. elementary school together, so most of them already knew each other. That made me even more nervous. The only person I knew who was going to Pinecrest was a geeky kid named Nate Grossman, who I didn't really interact with that much in Topanga. I also felt an intense fear of what middle school life would be like. I didn't know how to act around girls, I didn't know what was cool anymore, I had no friends there. I simply didn't know what to do. I felt like I was walking into a snowstorm without a coat. My parents led me into the school to say goodbye, and then it was time for me to start my first class. I had to take multiple classes with different teachers now. This was also a new concept for me and it made me extremely uncomfortable. Since this was a private school, I had to wear a uniform, something I hadn't done since going to Dorset House in England. I thought Dorset it was a good thing though. I didn't England. have to worry about what I would have to wear on the first day. Although For I'm the first English, few days, so I, I would go into a defensive shell and didn't really talk to anyone. I don't know. I did observe. Day. However, I observed how everyone acted, who the cool kids were, what they were like. We're like a third of the this. Don't the social worry. challenges Look that I faced in fifth grade were intensified tenfold. I noticed that there were two groups of cool, popular kids. They were Okay, let me see if I can skip ahead a bit in this. Um, oh no, this is, okay, this is kind I of I thought all of the cool kids were obnoxious jerks, jerks, but I tried as best as I could to hide my disgust and appear cool to them. They were obnoxious jerks, and yet somehow it was these boys who all of the girls flocked to. This showed me that the world was a brutal place, and human beings were nothing more than savage animals. Yeah, Bredens Everything my father taught me was brutal and wrong. He raised me to be a polite, kind, and gentleman. In a decent world, that would be I. Oh my god. Okay, here we go. You're getting to the supreme gentleman. I thought all of the cool kids were obnoxious jerks, jerks but I tried as best as I could to hide my disgust and appear cool to them. They were obnoxious jerks, and yet somehow it was they who all the girls flocked to. They showed me that the world was a brutal place, and human beings were nothing more than savage animals. Everything my father taught me was proven wrong. He raised me to be the supreme gentleman. In a decent world, that would be ideal. But the polite, kind gentleman doesn't win in the real world. He wasn't a polite, kind gentleman. He was a fucking sociopathic pathological narcissist as this story should make extremely clear um let's see here uh the girls didn't flock to gen the gentleman they flocked to the alpha male yes <laughs> this delta male here it was too much for me to handle i was still a little boy with a fragile mind thinking about such things would only crush my innocence and it eventually will i mean let's be honest what does elliot have to offer women um like, like ignoring the, the eternal thought and everything. Like, what is interesting about him to women? Um, he's not funny. He's not charming. He's not intelligent. He's not interesting. He's not... I guess he's okay looking. But he really lacks anything that would make a woman intrigued with him. I guess he's wealthy and okay looking. But... It's like, I mean, I guess at least with me, and I have very, like, no experience in this area, at least I'm, like, funny. Like, I can joke, and at least I, I can, like, be someone to talk to. But Elliot, like, is just fucking boring. He would just sit around at the back and give, like, women secret 
like creepy sex looks, and that's pretty much all he can do. Well, but not at this point. I subconsciously wanted to enjoy my childhood as much as I could, so I tried not to think about this new revelation and enjoy life in the moment. I put it all aside, to be pondered over later, my whole world had changed. The cool thing to do now was to be popular with girls. I didn't know how to go about doing that. Skateboarding, I was able to do. Dressing well, that was simple. But attracting attention from girls? How of the blazes was I going to do that? I didn't even understand what was so special about it either, but everyone seemed to place so much importance on it. This made me even more shy, and I became known as the shy new kid. Thankfully, some kids started reaching out to me, and I had a few chances to integrate within a couple of weeks. The first boy to talk to me was Bryce Miller. He asked me if I had any friends at the school, because he always saw me alone. I admitted that I had no friends, and he offered to be my first friend. I was very grateful for this. Fuck again, you, Bryce Miller. You're another skateboard. detractor. Kids that I knew how to skateboard and that I could do some tricks. This got them to treat me more cordially. I even talked to Robert Morgan a few times, who I hated and yet subconsciously revered for being so popular. Whenever a so-called popular kid would Fuck say, you, to me, more I felt immense satisfaction. Inevitably, <laughs> I started to become known to the girls of my school. And surprisingly, they treated me quite well. It was a huge relief. A little school was <coughs> the last time in my life where I wouldn't be completely invisible to girls. All of the pretty girls had a peculiar habit of hugging boys they knew as a form of greeting, and some of them hugged me. I didn't understand why, but it felt like the best feeling ever. I was 100 times... Okay, this is sound going to sound super arrogant and autistic to say, but... People do actually generally like me in real life. Um, I don't know, people do normally like my sense of humor. At least more than Elliot Rogers. Then again, like, has Elliot Rogers said anything funny or clever? I mean, this whole thing is literally him just complaining about his life. hundred times more satisfied from getting a hug from a pretty girl than getting a high five from a popular boy. It was a new experience that enraptured every fiber of my being. The 7th and 8th grade girls were especially kind to me. I guess they thought I was cute in a boyish sort of way. This made my initial experience of middle school much better. I decided to attend a school dance in early October. A school dance was completely foreign to me. Elementary schools didn't have them, of course, and I only knew about them from watching typical American shows on television. I thought it was something I had to do in order to be cool. I was very nervous, naturally, but I pushed myself to go ahead with it. When I got there, Robert Morgan saw me and asked me if I wanted to hang out with his group. I was grateful for this, and I ended up having a nice time. I was shocked that some 7th and 8th grade girls offered to dance with me. They came up to me in a group and taught me how to slow dance. I had to place my hands on their hips while they placed their hands on my shoulders, and we would move slowly with the music. They were all taller than me, and I was terrified, but it felt so. I but was a mad lad. would be the only time in my life where I would have a satisfying experience with girls. The only time. Halloween of this year marked the last time I would ever go trick-or-treating. After this year, I would be too old for it. Mother took us to the Lemelsons, and I decided to not dress up in any costume. I went as myself, sporting my black pine crest sweater. As it was my last time trick or treating, it would be the last time I would have any sort of fun on Halloween. And I didn't have a it was lot of the fun. last time it I was would nice enjoy to Halloween. James and Noah, like we had been doing. Oh, I, I wasn't um I wasn't sneezing, I was just joking. I was jokingly taking an in depth uh, hail of breath because of um because of Elliot Rogers' surprise Doing that women were past, paying attention. My father to him. cut off a portion of the child support he had been paying my mother, which forced my mother to move house. We moved to a small blue house on Glade Avenue in Canuga Park. I didn't like Canuga Park at all. It was a very probably cut off child support to give more money to his, um, that we would have to live there during his, week. his the house four of uh, stepmother. It had four yeah, I called her a whore. Mother's old house. Right, my up. new room was a lot larger than my she own. She sounds one. like a and fucking fool. My mother always had her own ways of making everything better. I would still enjoy my time in mother's small house more than my time in father's big with Land Hills house. Along with this move, there came a new change in our rotation schedule. What does his mother do for that we would stay at the house house like more, have instead a of switching one week, one week? Mother would have us for all of the weekdays, and we would go to father's on the weekends when he was in town. Around the same time that my mother moved, James's family moved as well, to another Lemelson owned house in the Palisades. They would only remain in this house for a very brief period, because a tragic event would soon occur in James's family. One day, at school, I was sitting in my class when I was suddenly called to the office. My mother was there, waiting to pick me up. I got into her car, and the three of us drove out of my school and parked on the side of Shute Avenue. She told us the dire news. James's mother, Kim Ellis, had just passed away from breast cancer. I cried for a bit. Kim was a very kind-hearted person and the mother of my best friend. She had been Fuck you, Kim Ellis. Years, you made I me sad. I was having a good James day. I was walking and the wind blew up the skirt of the girl in front of me and I saw some of her upper thigh and then you had to fucking die of cancer. Fuck you. Feeling. He just lost his own mother. It made me think of how horrible I would feel if the same thing happened to my own mother. Just the thought alone filled me with pain. There was to be a get-together of family friends at James's house that night in honor of Kim. On the way, I thought about how I would approach James on the subject. The amount of grief he must be feeling. I couldn't even imagine it. 
The last similar experience was the death of my grandfather, and I was only four years old then. When we arrived, I looked for James, and found him sitting in his room. I gently offered my deepest condolences for his loss. He remained very strong, obviously hiding his emotions. He looked very sad, in an extremely stoic sort of way. He told me he fully accepted what had happened, that his mother was dead and that was the end of it. That was all we spoke on the matter. We tried not to think about it for the rest of the night, and later on I played tag in his backyard with him and some of his friends. I remained very shy during my sixth grade year, and I would always be labeled as a quiet kid. I wasn't able to establish any friends that I could have playdates with, so the only playdates I had was with old friends from... Who the fuck like has playdates in sixth in grade? Role, and I was content with it. Uh, I tried my best to improve really my social situation during weird. school time. A few girls continued to pay attention to me, saying hi as I walked by them and occasionally giving me hugs, but I felt bitter at the fact that I wasn't able to truly hang out with them like the popular boys were doing. In order to not be seen as a complete loner at school, I ended up making friends with a kid named Connor Hanrahan. Connor was not a popular kid because Fuck you, like Connor! Him. Despite this, he was one of the most pompous assholes of the school, even more so than any of the most popular boys. Connor was a true bully. I started hanging out with him during recess and lunch, and we made a few jokes with each other and had a few good laughs, but he would always push me around and act tough. I was so timid back then that I didn't care. I- Connor... Connor's like another one of these, these, these fucking frenemies. How many frenemies does this guy have? Care. Like every human being. When I stayed back after school one day, my mother saw me with Connor when she came to pick me up. She has been concerned about me not making any new friends at Pinecrest, and I suppose she was relieved to see me with a friend. She invited Connor to come over to my house, which he accepted. I was a bit hesitant to hesitant to invite anyone from Pinecrest to my mother's house because it was located in Penumbra Park, a bad area, and most of the kids at Pinecrest were upper middle class who would look down on me for living there. But I couldn't back out of this once more. What is with this status thing? Like, he's too young to be this interested in status. Like, he's like, oh, they, I went to, uh, my mother lived in this area that wasn't, like, posh enough. And I, I felt inferior because my mother didn't live where the cool kids lived. My mother wasn't one of the cool kids, and, like, I hated her. Fuck her, she wasn't a cool kid, because adults can be cool kids, I guess, because that's kind of like one of the... The morals of this story, I guess? I don't know. Once my mother invited Connor. He came over and all went well. We played a few video games for a couple of hours. But after that playdate, he would always rip on me for living in a poor house. He would also tell other kids at Pinecrest about it. This infuriated me to no end, and I would keep proclaiming that my father lives in a prestigious three-story house in the Woodland Hills Heights. I became vehemently obsessed with proving to Connor and everyone else that I wasn't poor. I went so far as to bring pictures of my father's house to school. I even considered inviting some people over to father's house, but I remembered my vow of never doing that due to the possibility that another incident would happen with Somalia, like the one that occurred years ago. It was at 11 years old when I first started using the internet on a regular basis. The internet was still considered a new phenomenon at the time. Before 11, I roughly knew how to browse websites and use email, but once I fully immersed myself in it, it really fascinated me. The popular social networking tool at that period was AOL Instant Messenger, or AIM. I made my first AIM account on my mother's computer, and she would let have one hour a day to explore it. I joined a few chat rooms. The prospect of talking to strangers from a computer was new and astounding to me. Towards the end of sixth grade, I still hadn't made a group of friends who I could see outside of school. The only social interactions I had outside of school were playdates with old friends from Topanga every now and again. Joining chat rooms through AOL temporarily filled in the social void for a few weeks. This will definitely not be the first time I would try to fill in that void with the internet. Once I established myself in the chat rooms, I made a few friends who I instant messaged frequently. Most of them were in middle school and some were in high school. I also talked to a few people I knew from Pinecrest over AIM. One friend who I met through a chat room suddenly emailed me pictures of beautiful naked girls, telling me to check this out. When I looked at the pictures, I was shocked beyond words. I had never seen my beautiful girls look like naked, and the sight filled me with strong and overwhelming emotions. I didn't know what was happening to me. Was it the first inkling of sexual desire in my body? I was traumatized. My childhood was fading away. Ominous fear swept over me, and I stopped talking to that person. As the sixth grade year came to a close, I felt dissatisfied and insignificant. Indeed, a whole new world had opened up. I saw naked women no for the first time. Pain. I still wanted to live. I as a couldn't child. deal with I it. Any proper friends and naked and women the were just so hard up. And that turned out to be a disaster for me. World. My mother and father both showed concern that I wasn't making any friends, but because I still saw some friends from Topanga, they didn't make a big deal out of it. I consider sixth grade to be the better year out of the three years I would spend in middle school. Girls actually paid attention to me. They knew who I was and I didn't feel like I was completely invisible. I was extremely shy with girls and could barely have a conversation with them, but I still interacted with girls more during this year than I would for any following year. The cool kids treated me nicely, despite my reputation as the quiet kid. I always felt like a loser compared to them, and I hated them for it, though I still wanted their approval. I wanted to be one of them. I wanted to be their I friend. I wanted to be the one of them. I came to truly being one of them was but they, they brought in lesser men. Parties, which were only a couple of weeks Supreme apart. Supreme gentlemen. Year. Both parties were at Skate Lab Scat Park. I hadn't been to Skate Lab for about a year, and when I walked in, all of the memories of going there with James filled my mind. I hadn't even skateboarded for a while, but after a few minutes on the ramps, my ability came back like magic. They were all quite impressed. I bet they thought I would end up sucking at it. I was happy to prove them wrong. Indeed, sixth grade was the peak of my life at Pinecrest. It would only go downhill from there. My mother bought me a brand new video game console, the Xbox. I heard a lot of kids talking about how great the Xbox the was. The Xbox! School, so I, really eager to one. I liked the Xbox much more than the PlayStation 2. The graphics were better and the games were more to my taste. With the Xbox, I got the game Halo. At first, I found Halo to be very difficult and I gave up on it a few times. 
I had no idea that Halo would soon become one of my favorite video game series that I ever played. I was extremely happy and relieved when summer came. Middle school was much more stressful than elementary school, both socially and academically. Summer would provide a well-needed break from all of it. I started seeing some old friends. Has he mentioned, like, any interests? Because I remember when I was his age, I would read a lot of books. I, I had a lot of fun. Uh, I read, would read a lot of sci-fi books. I'd read a lot of history books. I watched a lot of movies. I had, like, a lot of interests. Like, I was really interested in, like, World War II history and stuff like that. He has no interests other than, than being popular. And he sucked at that, too. He failed at everything. He even failed at being a school shooter. He was like the worst fucking school shooter ever. So that was like the, the life of Elliot Rogers. To just suck at absolutely everything. Old friends from Topanga more frequently. Among these were John Joe Glenn and Charlie Converse. Charlie wasn't really one of my main friends at Topanga Elementary. I had a few playdates with him here and there, but not that many. It was only until after 5th grade graduation that our real friendship began. He always had a charming and humble personality, and he was well-liked by everyone at Topanga. He came over to my mother's house a few times after I got my Xbox, where he tried to help me get past the hardest level of Halo. John Joe and Charlie were very close friends with each other, and eventually I would start to see them at the same time. John Joe invited me to his father's apartment in Hollywood for a sleepover. I found his apartment to be very dingy, but I had so much fun that I didn't even care. He lived just across the street from a huge psychology building. We got together with a group of his friends and snuck into the building's courtyard at night to play hide-and-seek tag. This was the first time I had been out having fun with a group of kids my age without any adult supervision. It was very amusing. Fuck you, John Joe. Show. We played counters bad for day on the Nintendo 64. The Nintendo 64 was a very old console at this point in time, especially after I now had an Xbox and a PS2. But I was entertained by counters bad for day so much that I asked my mother to buy it for me the next day. James Ellis moved yet again to another house in the Palisades. After the death of his mother, James's father Art quickly made the decision to move again. Art rented a small house on Temecula Street near the renowned Palisades Bluffs. There they would remain for a very long time, and all of the most significant experiences I would have with James in the future would take place there. At this time, though, I wasn't seeing James that much. We slowly drifted apart after we lost our common interest in skateboarding. We still considered each other friends, and we would still see each other occasionally, almost as a courtesy. But our friendship would be at a standstill during our middle school years. I was enjoying a lovely summer, but suddenly my mother said that I had to go to summer camp at Pinecrest. This was a decision she made with my father, because they thought it would be healthy for me. I didn't like this one bit. It was a last minute decision. One moment I was relaxing and enjoying my summer break, the next my mother was waking me up early to take me to my first day of camp at Pinecrest. Gratefully, summer camp would only Fuck last you, mother. Summer Fuck you for Pinecrest making me go to Pinecrest. And I recognized my old kindergarten class. It was a mix of middle school and elementary school kids, and I made a few friends with some kids who were younger than me. At this camp, an incident happened that would scar me for life. Okay, let's see here. Oh, okay. It's hard to I skip ahead because this whole thing is actually pretty interesting. Times worse than from men. He's and not really that bad a writer, to be perfectly honest. I felt so small and vulnerable. I couldn't believe that this girl was so horrible to me, and I thought that it was because she viewed me as a loser. That was the first experience of female cruelty I endured, and it traumatized me to no end. It made me even more nervous around girls, and I would be extremely weary and cautious of them from that point on. Before summer camp ended, I saw that same girl hanging out with Orin AKs a few times. Orin AKs was one of the popular kids in my grade. I hated Orin so much when I saw him with her. It made me feel so inferior. That this girl was mean to me and yet she liked Orin. Thankfully, Orin wouldn't be returning to Pinecrest for 7th grade, and I would never see him again. Fuck you, Orin. You're a fucking detractor. When summer camp ended, that experience with the mean girl ruined it for me. Hell, it ruined a part of my life. Whenever I think about summer camp, I would think about the girl, and my emotions would flare up. My 12th birthday followed. I decided not to do anything for it. Mother took me and my sister out to a Japanese restaurant to celebrate it. Twelve seemed like a big number to me back then. One more year and I would be a teenager. It was hard to believe. Twelve years old. For the rest of the summer, I resumed my routine of relaxing and having playdates. I tried to forget about what happened at summer camp as much as I could. John Joe came over to my house, where he slept over for the first time. We played a few video games, and then he told me that he wanted to take me to a place called Planet Cyber, a cyber cafe that had all of the best online PC games. I knew nothing of the sort, but it was just down the street from my mother's house. I walked there with him, eager to experience something new. This was my first experience with online gaming. Playing video games with people over uh -oh. the internet invoked a whole new level of fascination in me. Talking to people over AIM was fun and new, but this, this was tremendous. I always loved playing multiplayer mode. This is about when he's gonna get addicted with to World of Warcraft. I do whatever I want. I that was the kiss of death when I got the hang of it after playing with John Joe for a few hours. The games we played were Day of Defeat and Counter Strike. Mother took me and Georgia on two little vacation trips in the same week. For the first trip, we went to Long Beach, where we stayed at the Hyatt Hotel. It reminded me of our little trip to Ventura two years previously. We visited the harbor and the aquarium. The three of us really bonded on this trip. We went home for a couple of days before going on the second trip. For the second trip, we went to Legal and stayed at the resort there. The resort was exceedingly beautiful, with a huge swimming pool and spa. We met up with the family of one of George's friends and explored the entirety of Legal. When we got home from our marvelous trip, I had another sleepover with John Joe. Okay, uh, let me see here. Uh, let's skip ahead a bit. Um, just more boring shit. Um, okay, here we go. On 
one such Wednesday, Charlie introduced me to the game Warcraft 3. It was like no game I had ever played before. It enabled the player to build an army and battle against other players online. After the first round of Warcraft 3, going up against John, Joe, and Charlie, I was captivated. The game was so much fun. I couldn't help but think about it every second for the next two days. When the following Friday arrived, we played it for most of the day and well into the night. My initially happy interest in the game Warcraft 3 had an ominous tone to it. This was the beginning of a long relationship with the Warcraft franchise. In less than a year from that point, they would release their ultimate game, World of Warcraft, a game that I would find sanctuary in for most of my teenage years. Seventh grade flew by very fast. A game I would find sanctuary in. Yeah, he became addicted to World of Warcraft. That was um, that was kind of one of the kisses of death for him. I tried World of Warcraft back and I just didn't like it very much. I just didn't find it particularly interesting compared to just a lot of games that were out there at the time. So, yeah. World of Warcraft was just kind of meh. But, um, yeah, I guess it is what it is. Nothing I can do, but I digress. Fast. My school life was a continuation of sixth grade. I mingled with acquaintances here and there and behaved nicely with everyone. The difference is that I was having so much fun outside of school with my friends at Planet Cyber that I didn't really care about getting popular at school or getting attention from girls. I was enjoying my very last year of childhood. My twelfth year was one of the best years of my life in the last year that I was happy. I'm glad that I can at least say I made the best of it. I gave no thought at all to my future or the fact that puberty was just around the corner. I barely even knew much about what puberty was. With puberty, my whole world would change and my entire life would collapse into utter despair. My whole life would have handled things that I knew hard if was prepared. The summer was long awaited. Work. I was having the time of my life, and once school was out, I couldn't wait to spend the summer relaxing and doing fun things. I was relieved that neither of my parents made me attend summer camp. I suppose I had gotten too old for it. The summer was mine to enjoy however I wanted. It was like a coveted treasure that I could only hold for a few moments, but those moments would last forever in memory. It was my last summer before puberty. My last summer of innocence. My last summer of true happiness and satisfaction with life. I continued my traditional Friday sleepovers with Charlie, John, Joe, and Elijah. Because there was no more school, they would sometimes come over on other days as well. I managed to beat the entire game of Halo on Legendary mode with Elijah's help, an impressive feat. Philip and Jeffrey came over quite a lot as well. Philip was always the mature and insightful brother, while Jeffrey was the wild and funny one. Seeing the two of them together always made for an interesting and excitable mix. Their mother, Kathy, brought them over on weekdays quite often. We drank a lot of soda, ate a lot of candy, and played with scooters and skates. Okay, let me skip ahead. Okay, we got some boring stuff about other... Oh, okay, here we go. Maybe the stuff about Malaysia will be interesting. Walked around and explored, went shopping, visited all the common areas, and had a nice meal at one of the restaurants. There were a lot of foreign candies and sodas that I was curious to try. Traveling with just my mother and sister was a lot less stressful than traveling with father and Somalia. It was wonderful. When we arrived in Malaysia, we met up with my grandma Ma, my mother's sister Min and her husband Jack, and cousin Emma. They were also visiting Malaysia from England. We all stayed at a tall hotel building near the beach. After we unpacked everything at the hotel, some of my mother's relatives who lived in Malaysia came to see us. We had a birthday celebration for me at the hotel that night. Before I went to sleep, I pondered over the fact that I was now a teenager. I had a lovely time on this vacation. Our hotel suite was on one of the highest floors of the building, and it had an exquisite deck that provided a view of the ocean. During the trip, we toured around the island of Penang, visited Georgetown, went to a fun water park, and had very delicious meals at many exotic restaurants. Just relaxing and watching movies at the hotel was a joy in itself. The vacation was so nice that I didn't even miss my life at home. The three weeks flew by very fast, and I cried a little when it was over. It was a good sadness. I celebrated my birthday again at Father's It was a we good to sadness. I was allowed to have my very first glass of beer for this celebration. I always thought of alcoholic drinks, such as beer and wine, as mysterious drinks that were forbidden to children like myself. Father would let me have only a small sip of wine from time to time. Having my first glass of beer felt like a big honor. For my present, I got my first cell phone. During this era, uh -oh. cell phones were like a rite of passage for kids my age. I always envied the kids who had a cell phone. John Joe had a silver sprint phone with green lighting that I always Fuck you, John Joe. A cell phone of my own made me feel so proud. My phone was a silver T-Mobile phone with blue lighting. I loved the satisfaction I felt when I opened it up and saw the pretty lights. 13 years old, I enjoyed the rest of the, the summer's pretty as I lights. Could. On the first Planet Cyber session after being back for vacation, lights. I met up with John Joe. They had a new Warcraft 3 expansion available to play, and the two of us tried it out. I had a sleepover with Charlie and Elijah, and they introduced me to their friend Julian Ritz Bar. Julian went to Topanga Elementary with us, though he was two grades lower, so I never knew him beforehand. I thought he was very cool, but a bit stupid. We competed with each other at Planet Cyber. I continued to see him with Charlie and Elijah a few more times after that. Coincidentally, Julian's parents were friends with Rom Lemelson, and I didn't know this at the time. A few years down the line, I would cross paths with Julian again at one of the Lemelson's parties, where I would- Fuck you, Julian. Is everybody he meets literally his mortal enemy? That seems to be... Okay, let's see here. When Christmas came, I told Father that I would like a new computer game. Father took me out shopping for my new present. We first went to Comp USA on Victory Boulevard, but they didn't have a large selection of games. I was on the verge of just choosing to buy Diablo 2, a game I had already spent hours on at Planet Cyber. But then, I decided that since Best Buy was just across the street, we should go and have a look at the games there. At Best Buy, I saw the game World of Warcraft. It had just come out a few weeks ago. I picked up the box and looked at it for a few minutes. The game looked amazing and alluring, so I decided to choose World of Warcraft as my Christmas present. Uh -oh. I spent more time looking it over and reading about it on the way home. The only computer I could play World of Warcraft on was Father's laptop, but Father was always using his laptop for work. I had to wait a long time to get a chance to play it. After reading the game manual, <coughs> I was extremely excited to play it. It was a whole new... Wait a minute, he bought a game that he couldn't play for Christmas? What the fuck does that mean? 
New type of game for me, an MMORPG that would enable me to make my own character in a huge online fantasy world, and it was a world I was already familiar with through playing Warcraft 3. This game was a hundred times bigger than any game I've played in the past. The more I read about the game, the more anticipated I became. After almost a month went by after getting World of Warcraft, I was finally able to play it. I made a WoW account with my father, and then I created my first character, a Night Elf Druid. It really blew my mind. My first experience with WoW was like stepping into another world of excitement and adventure. It was a video game world, but they made it so realistic that it was like living another life, a more exciting life. My life was getting more and more depressing at that point, and WoW would fill in the void. It felt refreshing and relieving. I was only able to play it for a few hours for my first session. It was all I would think about when I wasn't able to play it. Mother didn't have a good enough computer to run World of Warcraft, so I felt a bit frustrated because of that. I thought of how awesome it would be if Planet Cyber had the game, but I doubted that. It did. One afternoon, I walked to Planet Cyber with my WoW discs and asked them if they can install my discs onto one of the computers. The owner told me the game was already being installed, and I was thrilled to hear those words. It wasn't ready yet, however, and I had to wait. I kept what? going back to Planet Cyber every day to wait for it, and played other games there while they were- How does it take that long? Just install it overnight. What the fuck is that? I don't know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. They were still processing it. It was a fun wait, and I knew I will eventually be able to play it. Finally, after spending three days at Planet Cyber waiting, it was ready. I loaded the game and logged onto my account. I was completely ecstatic. I spent all of my free time in the next few days playing it. The owner of Planet Cyber came to know me because of the series of events, and he named me his best customer. I invited Charlie over, and he came with Steven, an old friend. Okay, I'll be back in a couple minutes, couple minutes guys. I'm just going to leave this on. Accounts, and we went to Planet Cyber to play it together. I made a new character on their server just to play with him, though I would eventually discard this character. I saw Charlie only a few more times after that. Elijah was busy with some life problems and stopped coming over. John Joe simply vanished from my life at this point, for no particular reason. I can't recall the exact last time I saw him, but it was around this period. My mother decided to move to an apartment in Woodland Hills. I reacted indignantly. An apartment. I had never lived in an apartment before, and I always thought of apartments as being poor and low class. I would be embarrassed to admit it to anyone. The apartment building was called the Renaissance Apartments, near the Warner Center area of Woodland Hills. We moved into a two-bedroom apartment. Mother knew I was too old to share a room with my sister, so she gave me the second bedroom, and she and my sister shared the master bedroom. Leaving the Blue House on Glade Avenue was hard. I had so many good times with my friends there. And to move out of it at the very time that I stopped seeing those friends. It was quite emotional. I cried on our last day there. My mother's new apartment was not walking distance from Planet Cyber, and I was a bit embarrassed to show that I lived in an apartment, so I stopped seeing any friends. Elijah was the last person in the group who I saw. I was at Planet Cyber and he tapped me on the shoulder. It was a random meeting. The two of us talked for a bit about the new Halo 2 game, and I showed him my WoW character. That was the last time I saw him. Eventually, I lost all contact with Charlie, John Joe, and Elijah. The friends I had such a good times with for the last two years were no longer my friends. They were lost to me. I also stopped seeing Philip and Jeffrey. They simply just forgot about me, I assumed. The only friend who remained to me was James Ellis. The upside of moving to the apartment was that my mother acquired high-speed internet. I was able to play World of Warcraft on her computer, along with Halo 2 on Xbox Live. This was the point when my social life ended completely. I would never have a satisfying social life ever again. It was the beginning of a very lonely period of my life, in which my only social interactions would be online through video games, with the sole exception being my friendship with James. The ability to play video games with people online temporarily filled in the social void. I got caught up in it, and I was too young and naive to realize the severity of how far I had fallen. I was too scared to accept it. This loss of a social life, coupled with the advent of puberty, caused me to die a little inside. It was too much for me to handle, and I stopped caring about my life and my future. I even stopped caring about what people thought of me. I hid myself away in the online world of Warcraft, a place where I felt comfortable and secure. Part 4. Stuck in the Void. Age 13 to 17, James Ellis also acquired Xbox Live with Halo 2. I started to play it with him online, and our friendship reignited after being stable for the previous year. We would meet up online after school, or on Saturday mornings. The two of us battled on Halo 2 over the internet, just like we did with our Nintendo 64 games when we were children. James would be my only friend throughout the next depressing and lonely period of my life. My friendship with James helped me cope with the loneliness. The very few fun times we would have were like a light in the darkness for me. Now that I was able to play World of Warcraft at my mother's house with no limitations, aside from school and homework, I became very addicted to the game and my character in it. It was all I cared about. I was so immersed in the game that I no longer cared about what people thought of me. I only saw school as something that took time away from WoW. I became very bored at school, mainly due to the fact that I was still the invisible quiet kid. To alleviate this boredom, I started to act weird and annoying to people just to gain attention. I became known as the weird kid at Pinecrest, and people started to make fun of me, but I didn't care. I had my online games to distract me from the harsh realities of life that I was too scared to face. The only time I did care was when a group of popular 7th grade girls started teasing me, which hurt a lot. One of these girls was Manette Moyo, a pretty blonde girl who was Ashton's younger sister. She must have thought I was an ultimate loser. I hated her so much, and I will never forget her. I started to hate all girls because of this. I saw them as mean, cool, and hard. Okay, let's see here. Let me skip ahead a bit. What's this? Somalia gave birth to a newborn baby boy, and they named him Jazz. Who the fuck names their kid Jazz? That's that is um that is a swipple name if I've ever heard one. Uh let's see here. My experience during middle school really darkened my view of the world, and it would only get darker from then on, as I suffered more and more. The way I was treated by girls at this time, especially by that evil bitch Manette Moyo, sparked an intense fear of girls. The funny part of this is that I had a secret crush on Manette. She was the first girl I ever had a crush on, and I never admitted it to anyone. To be teased and ridiculed by the girl I had a crush on wounded me deeply. The world that I grew up thinking was bright and blissful was all over. I was living in a depraved world, and I didn't want to accept it. I didn't want to give any thought to it. That is why I immersed myself entirely into my online games like World of Warcraft. I felt safe there. I was so obsessed with playing WoW that I never gave much serious thought to the fact that I would have to go to high school soon. As the end of middle school neared, the prospects started to loom over me more and more. 
At one moment I pictured what my life in high school would be like, based on how things have been for me in middle school. It was not a bright picture. I didn't want to have to deal with the cruelty of girls in high school, and I imagined that it would be much worse than anything I've ever experienced. I begged my parents to send me to Crespi Carmelite High School, a Catholic all-boys school. Father took me there for a tour, and it didn't look so bad. It was a very prestigious private school. At least I wouldn't have to deal with any fear of girls there. We submitted an application. A few weeks later I received the news that I had been accepted to Crespi. Eighth grade graduation was a nightmare. Everyone was required to go up on stage and speak to the whole audience. We had to say our name, and tell everyone what school we were planning on going to. The audience consisted of all of the students' families, as well as any siblings or friends who wished to attend. Both of my parents came, as well as Samaya, Khadija, my sister, and even my baby brother Jazz. It took place in the evening. As I lined up, I could feel myself shaking. I was scared even to speak in front of the classroom. To speak in a microphone to hundreds of people was too much. I didn't understand how everyone else seemed to be fine with it. I envied their bravery. When my name was called, I didn't want to go, but it was required of me, and I pushed myself to do it. I walked up to the microphone and nervously said my name is Elliot, and I plan on going to Crespi High School. I heard my own voice in the speakers and saw everyone staring at me. It made me cringe. I quickly walked away for the next this person to go. This book makes it was me over. cringe. Eighth grade was over. Middle school was over. I said a few farewells to the people I knew. Alfred Graham and Bryce Miller told me they were going to Crespi as well. At least I will know two people at Crespi on the first day, I thought. The thought of going to high school sent a shiver through me. I put it in the back of my mind to deal with later. After the ceremony, I said goodbye to the principal, and she congratulated me on completing middle school. On the way home, my family seemed very proud of me. I didn't feel proud. I didn't feel like I accomplished anything. Middle school, though it started out okay in the first two years, ended up being a disaster. For the summer break, I planned on spending the whole time playing WoW and forgetting about everything else. I reached the highest level on my WoW character, level 60. I actually considered this to be a huge and important accomplishment. I it was the, the greatest character achievement character of his life, life reaching level 60. I couldn't wait 60. to play my character further, exploring everything the game had to offer and collecting more armor pieces and trinkets. In just a week into my summer break, my mother told me that father and Samaya were going to Morocco, and I would be forced to go with them. This news upset me tremendously. I then asked how long this trip would be, and I was told it would be eight weeks. Eight weeks? I could not believe what I was hearing. I threw a big tantrum. For one thing, I was never enthusiastic about Morocco. The country is very backwards, and that made me very uncomfortable. They didn't even have... Why is he going there with just his stepmother who he has no relationship with? I don't know. It doesn't make sense. Have the latest video games. And to be forced to go there for eight weeks. That would take up the entire summer and the first two weeks of high school. It was even longer than the last time we went, and I thought that was too long. I wouldn't be able to play WoW at all for two whole months. The prospect devastated me. I begged my mother to not let me go, but father and Samaya insisted on bringing me in Georgia, and my mother was probably looking forward to having two months without children to look after. The decision was made. The plans were set. They already had a plane ticket ready for me. I was going to Morocco. I bet they all knew I would protest against going, which is why they told me last minute. The last day of Mother's Week was the day before we would depart. Mother took me and my sister to a barbecue at the house of her friends. Okay, let me see here. Okay. As I expected, the journey there was a disaster. Baby Jazz cried a lot during the trip, and Samaya wasn't at her best of moods. We didn't take first class, and we had to make three stops. Once in Michigan, again in Paris, and yet again in Casablanca, before taking a small plane to Tangier. It was a miserable journey, the complete opposite of the great time I had a year ago on the trip to Malaysia. We took a taxi to Khadija's house right after we arrived. Khadija went home to Morocco on a different plane a few days before us, and she was already settled in. After unpacking at Khadija's house, we walked to Samaya's father's huge house where I met Eamon again. I remembered playing with Eamon on my last trip to Morocco. He grew up a lot since then. To my dismay, he was taller and stronger than me, despite <coughs> being two years younger. I was always short and physically weak. That's how it's been all my life. We instantly became friends again after catching up a little, and I played hide and seek tag with him and his two younger brothers. I just liked having to be in Morocco for the whole summer, but I tried to make the best of it. Eamon made the time I spent there more fun. We often went out by ourselves to explore the city of Tangier. Eamon knew where everything was, and Samaya trusted him to show me around. Georgia sometimes came with us. We had a few good times together, and we got along well. The Thompsons joined us in Morocco a couple of weeks after we arrived. Georgia was happy that Alessandra, Josh, and Isabella were there to play with her. I was not happy about it. I was so scared of girls at that time that I kept my distance from Alessandra and Isabella. I didn't want to admit to Eamon that I was scared of girls though, that would have been embarrassing, so I just told him that I thought they were too immature. He didn't understand this, because I myself was very immature at the time. For my 14th birthday, Samaya organized a small party at her father's house. Most of the guests were her Moroccan friends, and some of them didn't even know that the party was for my birthday. I was a bit annoyed by this. They had a cake arranged for me, and when it was brought out everyone gathered to wish me a happy birthday. That would be the last time I spent my birthday with more people than just my family. I was amazed that I was actually 14. 14 sounded like such a big number. I didn't feel 14. I still felt like a kid, and in all appearances, I was. Father couldn't even make it for my birthday. I was a bit upset about this. He came a few days after it. Once he arrived, we toured around Tangier and a few other areas as a family. Khadija and Eamon sometimes came along with us. Samaria's father owned a house on the beach, and we usually went there for beach trips. I caught a virus while swimming in the ocean once, which caused me to get extremely ill. I spent a whole week of a vacation in bed, aching and vomiting. I was never there before in my life. Whenever I would think about Morocco in the future, I thought about the horrid experience. At one time towards the end of the trip, when I had a sleepover with Eamon at Samaria's father's house, he showed me some European porn videos in the middle of the night. I could observe the act of sex in much more detail than the one glimpse I had at Planet Cyber. I didn't want what to look, the but fuck? my curiosity got the better of me. To see a video of human beings doing such weird and What the fuck? The... Uh, fuck you, Eamon. So Maester Eamon destroyed his life. Things with each other Fucking me. blood of the dragon. I couldn't understand what I was seeing. And yet, I noticed I was feeling aroused. I felt desire to do those things. To have sex with the naked woman I saw in the video. It was a funny feeling that overwhelmed my whole body. I could feel my penis getting hard. 
This is when I noticed that I was finally going through puberty. Heaven saved me. The trip was way too long, and towards the end I felt depressed and homesick. All I wanted was to go back home and play WoW, and yet I had to accept that once I did get home, I had to start high school right away. I supposed that being able to play WoW again would make up for that, though. And it would sure be staying in Morocco for any longer. I was growing tired of it, 14 years old. I felt a wave of relief when we arrived back in the United States. We had to travel separately from father again because he had a different flight schedule, but it wasn't that bad on the way back because I was looking forward to playing WoW again. I only had one free day before I had to start school. When I got back to mother's house, I gave her a big hug. That was the longest time I had been away from mother. After that, I immediately asked if I could go on her computer and play my game. I logged onto my character, which was just the way I left it two months ago. I said hi to all of my online friends and tried to catch up on everything. The dreaded day arrived all too soon. I had to start high school. School had already begun while I was still in Morocco, so I would be the new kid again. That made it so much worse. My father drove me there on the first day. When we got there, I was intimidated by all the huge high school boys, and I cried in the car for a few minutes, telling my father that I was too scared to get out. I had to go, and eventually I did. We walked to the main office where I ran into Bryce Miller. We greeted each other before I was let up to join my first class of the day. Alfred Graham was in that class, and he helped me settle in. During lunchtime, Alfred showed me around the whole school. I started to feel a lot more comfortable. He introduced me to some of the other freshmen. In the courtyard, I met Pascal and his clique of friends. I immediately took a disliking to them. Pascal was cocky and popular, so I felt intimidated. He was like the crusty equivalent of Robert Morgan. As I met a few more people, I ran into Keaton Weber. I didn't expect to find Fuck anyone you, Robert Pascal. Morgan. It really took me by surprise. I hadn't seen Keaton since he left Topanga Elementary at the end of fourth So grade. many people he has, he was he's jealous Topanga, of. And he had his own of Literally, that's friends. the entirety of his life, life is just being jealous of people. I failed to make any new friends. Guilty of living of the world a that better life anymore. than me. On the very first week, I had my first experience of true bullying, not just the teasing I had at Pinecrest. Some horrible 12th graders saw me as a target because I looked like a 10-year-old and I was physically weak. They threw food at me during lunchtime and after school. Food it enraged me, but I was too scared to do anything about it. What kind of horrible, depraved people would poke fun at a boy younger than them who has just entered high school? I thought to myself, after the first few weeks of high school, I concluded that my time at Crespi would not be pleasant at all. I withdrew further into the world of Warcraft, neglecting my homework and spending all of my free time playing it. As a late birthday present, father bought me a new laptop that was able to run WoW. It wasn't a very powerful laptop, but it performed adequately. This enabled me to have more time playing my game. During Father's Week, Samari was always on my bed. Was, uh, I spent on my, bad idea. Since my room was on the bottom floor, secluded from the rest of the house. I was able to sneak as much time on it as I could. While I was playing while after dinner at Mother's house once, I heard my sister watching the new show Avatar, The Last Airbender on the television. I decided to check it out. I soon found myself really enjoying it. It was a magnificent story set in a fantasy world where people can control the power of the elements. Once I watched the first episode, I was hooked on the story. Prince Zuko was my favorite character. He was a banished prince who was trying to regain his rightful place in the world. I always related to him. Avatar, of The Last Airbender became did. my favorite TV. Show. My mother informed me that she was just on the phone to our Alice, and he told her that James now played World of Warcraft. I was very pleased to hear this. I could now share my greatest Yeah, okay, let's see here. Let me skip ahead. Uh, okay. What is this? Okay, here we go. We got Elliot Rogers describing what he started It was during this winter break that I experienced my first masturbation and ejaculation. It was one of the most peculiar and memorable experiences of my life. At this point, I was officially going through the stages of puberty, and I had lots of sexual urges. I often fantasized about hot naked girls while rubbing my penis against my mattress at night. One time, while doing this, I felt an intense stirring numbness all around my fully erect penis, and it extended all over my body. It felt magical and ecstatic, and I kept rubbing my penis on the mattress. That was when the orgasm Who the happened. fuck describes I couldn't how much pleasure I felt from that. I looked down at my penis to see that my semen had poured out all over it, like a volcanic eruption of white, sticky fluid. What was happening to me? I thought to myself with nervous excitement. It was like nothing I had ever seen or experienced before, something completely out of my world. I felt really guilty afterwards, so I refrained from telling anyone about it. I started to masturbate on a regular basis. At first, I only did it by rubbing my penis on my bed, but it eventually escalated to looking at pictures of girls online while rubbing my penis against my pants, uh -oh. fantasizing about doing sexual things with them. I didn't know how to access any porn sites, so I would just browse regular websites until I found a picture of a hot girl to masturbate to. I developed a very high sex drive, and it would always remain like this. This was the start of hell for me. Going through puberty utterly doomed my existence. It condemned me to live a life of suffering and unfulfilled desires. Even at that young age, I felt depressed because I wanted sex, yet I felt unworthy of it. I didn't think I was ever going to experience sex in reality, and I was right. I never did. I was finally interested in girls, but there was no way I could ever get them. And so my starvation began. The boys in my grade talked about sex a lot. Some of them even told me that they had sex with their girlfriends. This was the most devastating and traumatizing thing I've ever heard in my life. Boys having sex at my age of 14? I couldn't fathom it. How is it that they were able to have such intimate and pleasurable well, experiences with girls while I could only fantasize? Some of those women could have been... Some of those guys could have been lying. That is, uh, that's pretty likely. No? No, they obviously were just telling the truth. They all were. Fantasize about it? I frequently started asking myself. This was an all-boys school. How in the hell were those boys even able to meet girls to have sex with? I wondered. I hoped they were lying. I hoped against all hope. Hearing that really shook me to the core. Words cannot describe how much hatred and envy I felt for those boys. The hatred would only fester the more I suffer from my sexual starvation. I was too scared to tell anyone about it, and I hid it well. For a time, these recent events caused me to withdraw even further away from the world. I drowned all of my misery in my online games. World of Warcraft was the only thing I had left to live for. My grades at Crespi dropped dramatically. I just didn't care anymore. I hated that school. I didn't think about my future. World of Warcraft was the only thing 
Um, World of Warcraft was the only thing I had left to live for. Kind of like how Chris, the only thing that uh, Chris Chan had left to live for was Sonic at a young age. And that was the entire basis of his life. Was, I don't know. Creature, the only thing I give any serious thought to was my wild character. I had become very powerful in the game, and I was in one of the best guilds. With this guild, I participated in lots of five-hour raid events to collect better gear and armor for my character. Mother moved to a new house with a swimming pool that she was able to lease for a fair price. She picked me and my sister up from father's house and took us there as a surprise. It was located near the old blue house, though in a nicer area. This was on a day that I had an event on while in the afternoon, and I was very concerned about whether or not I would make it in time. So when we got to the new house, I didn't even look around and immediately hooked up my laptop to play WoW. I okay, let's see here. Okay, we have another detractor. The very last day of ninth grade was the worst. I was having PE at the gym, and one of my obnoxious classmates named Jesse was bragging about having sex with his girlfriend. I defiantly told him that I didn't believe him, so he played a voice recording of what sounded like him and his girlfriend having sex. I could hear a girl saying his name over and over again while she panted frantically. He grinned at me smugly. I felt so inferior to him, and I hated him. It was at that moment that I was called to the office. When I got there, my mother was waiting for me to take me home. I cried heavily as I told her about what happened earlier. That was the last day I ever set foot in Crespi Carmelite High School. Crespi was finished. I thought I could finally relax. Little did so some asshole played video of him having sex with... Does that stuff actually happen? Like, is that true? I don't know. I've never heard of that before. Especially at that age. Do people really record them fucking their girlfriends at that age and, like, play the audio? I don't know. Maybe I am just live a very sheltered life. That that doesn't sound like the truth. That sounds really weird to me. Uh, I don't know. Like I said, maybe I just live an extremely sheltered life under a rock or something, but... Eh. I don't know. Maybe someone in the chat can tell me. Little did I know that the worst was yet to come. They my parents did? Me with wow. horrible news. They were planning that on is, to school. That is fucked. Taft had five times as many students as Crespi. It was a public school. It had girls in it. And it had a bad reputation. I had never been so scared in my entire life. How could they do this to me? After knowing what I went through at Crespi, Taft High School would eat me alive and spit me out. I felt so betrayed by my parents. On top of that, they told me I had to go to summer school at Taft very soon. I failed a few classes at Crespi and I had to make up for them. The summer was supposed to be a time of peace and relaxation. This was turning out to be the worst summer of my life. I went with my parents to the Taft orientation event, and it was a horrific experience. I felt so dismayed at how large the school was, and how intimidating all of the tall students were. I even begged my parents to send me back to Crespi, because I knew Taft would be much worse. I had a foul time at summer school. I remember how I used to hate it when my parents made me go to summer camp. Summer camp was like heaven compared to summer school at Taft. I got lost on the first day. I was so terrified that I hid in the hallways during break time. I spent my time at summer school gruelingly waiting to go home so I could feel safe playing WoW. My 15th birthday wasn't in- Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, okay. It's hard, because there's just so much- Shit to go on here. The first week of Taft was living hell. I was bullied several times, even though I didn't know anyone there. After being so used to wearing a polo shirt with khaki pants as a school uniform at private schools, I continued to dress like that even after leaving Crespi. I didn't give any thought to how dirty I looked. I was too withdrawn, like a turtle tucked into his shell. I was still in the process. No, of eventually this time, book is so going to turn into rage. Like rage. I'll probably so stop. Uh, once, course, uh, I'm going to go a little bit longer I was and stop. And I have other stuff no to do today, but... I, I think we, we get a good introduction. This is about the first half of the book. Some boys randomly pushed me against the lockers and... as they walked me in the hall. One boy who was tall yeah, had long hair called me a loser over. right in front of his girlfriends. Yes, he had girls with him. Pretty girls. And I didn't seem to mind that he was such a good Yeah, we should really in fact, through this. I bet they liked him for it. This is how girls are, and I was starting to realize it. This was what truly opened my eyes to how brutal the world is. The most meanest and depraved of men come out on top, and women flock to these men. Their evil acts are rewarded by women, while the good, decent men are laughed at. It is sick, twisted, and wrong in every way. I hated the girls even more than the bullies because of this. The sheer cruelty of the world around me was so intense that I will never... Re I mean, has has Elliot ever done anything good and decent in his life? Has he ever, like, done anything that makes him seem like he's, like, a half-decent person? Everything he's done makes him sound like a whiny douchebag. I don't know, maybe I'm just... bitter and stuff, but... There's actually, like... I don't know, there, there's no evidence at any point in this story... That he wasn't a complete piece of shit. None. And this was written from his perspective, by the way. And he's an unreliable narrator. I, I think just keep that in mind as we're going through this. He's obviously lying about a lot of this stuff. And if his lies can't make him sound good, that is a really bad sign. If, like, he's so inept that he can't, like, lie to make him, him sound like a good person. But, um, yeah, it is what it is. Never recovered from the mental scars. Any experience I ever had before never traumatized me as much as this. I couldn't do it anymore. 
On the morning before the second week of Taft started, I broke down and cried in front of my mother, begging her not to make me go to that horrible place. I was so scared that I felt physically sick. I continued crying in the car on the way there, and my mother gave in. Instead of taking me to school, we went to the cafe at Gelson's in Calabasas where we had a big talk. I tried to explain how much I was suffering there. She just could not take me to school after that. When we were finished with Gelson's, she drove me to my father's house and told him about what happened. They agreed to take me out of Taft. I they switched to school schools again? My decided what to do with me. I took advantage of the time to You shouldn't be doing this to your kids. kids. The pain and suffering I had to endure at Taft was you all over, but the scars would remain. I tried to forget about it as much as I could. I took a deep breath and relaxed. After a month of recovery, my parents took me to look at two continuation high Why schools. Why didn't they homeschool like him? Because of low parental involvement. And do the rest of the work at home. One of them was His right parents next to obviously didn't really give a nice. shit about him. Parents preferred the one in I mean, his parents spoiled him. They bought him everything he wanted. But it's very clear they didn't spend any time with him. They weren't concerned about his future. In a sense, they were very neglectful. Um, even though they weren't physically neglectful. And like I said, they bought him everything he wanted. At the same time, he just... They, yeah, they were in a sense very um, neglectful of him. Was more structured and organized. It was called Independence High School, and they decided to send me there. Independence was a very small school with only three buildings and 100 students. The teachers were all very nice and understanding, and it had a relaxed and calm environment. I figured this was the best option for me. A week later, I started going to Independence High School. I didn't like any of the students there, as they were all slums with the exception of two or three boys. This wasn't a major concern, because I didn't care about having a social life at the point. All I wanted to do was hide away from the cruel All I wanted to do was high school gave me the play opportunity wow. to do just that. I only had to be at school for three or four hours per day, and all of the work was very easy with teachers available to help me with anything. After those short school hours, I had all the time in the world to do whatever I wanted, and I spent it playing role. So they literally sent him to, like, the shittiest place they could. Like, the, the, the they, they literally found a, a joke private high school with zero standards and sent him there. Because he was so inept at everything that they couldn't send him to a normal high school. So they're like, oh, well, I think the best thing for Elliot is to send him to a school where they, they place absolutely no academic expectations on him whatsoever. I don't know. If his parents had to beat the shit out of him, he probably would have turned out better. Playing World of Warcraft. One drawback was that I had to take the bus to school because my parents couldn't pick me up at such an early time of the day. Though it was embarrassing, I didn't care about appearances anymore, so I didn't make a big deal out of it. This was the perfect setup for a World of Warcraft addict. After school, every day, I fully indulged myself in my addiction to WoW. My only social interaction was with my online friends and with James. James. What kind of irresponsible parents would send their kid to a high school with no standards so he can play WoW more? James, who would occasionally come over to my Well, his, his stepmother did discipline, discipline him, but for, it was for was bullshit, and she was a thought, decided so... to invest all of his money in this first feature film, that. a documentary named Oh My God. In the film, he would interview various people about their opinions on religion and God. To make it, he took off to travel all over the world for a few months. Despite this, the one week, one week arrangement remained, and during Father's Week, I had to stay at Father's house with only small... So, his this father spent all his money to make a pretentious, anti-religious documentary that had no chance of succeeding, um, because he was a fucking douche. And his father will lose all his money on this shitty documentary that had no chance of succeeding. And he will stop paying child support as a result of this. And Elliot Rogers will go from being extremely wealthy to being moderately wealthy. Pain to live with, and she would have struck my time on WoW. I was hopeful about father's movie, however. He kept talking about how he would become very rich from it, and I fostered a hope that he would become rich. How naive I was. The movie would only bankrupt him in the future. On top of this, I had to deal with another change at father's house that angered me to no end. I had to give up my lovely, huge, and luxurious downstairs room. It was all because baby Jazz got a new nanny. Once again, Jazz's existence caused me to lose my room at father's house. This time, father made my room into his new office. Honestly, if my sister was named Jazz, I would have got her. one of them and the nanny got the other. My new room was much smaller, and it didn't have its own bathroom. My downstairs room was the best part of being at father's house, and it was all gone. I started to really hate going there. Father came back shortly for the winter break, before taking off again. A new expansion for World of Warcraft, called The Burning Crusade, came out in the beginning of January. I was extremely excited for this expansion. It added many new features to the game, new areas to explore, and raised the level cap to 70. It was like a whole new WoW game. I asked my father to buy it for me as a Christmas present. I can still remember the intense anticipation I felt as I installed it onto my laptop. I decided to transfer my WoW character to the same server as James, so that we could play together online and level up our characters in the new expansion. Through doing this, I met two of James's friends from the school, who also played on his server. They were two brothers named Steve and Mark. Steve is our age, and Mark is a couple years older. Me, James, Steve, and Mark would then always play together online as a group. I found them quite fun to play the game with, and it was nice to have some friends to play WoW with on a regular basis. Eventually, Steve and Mark decided to make new characters on a PvP server, which had play settings that were more to my liking. I chose to make a new character with them. I made a Blood Elf character that I leveled up very fast, and this became my main character in the game. James stayed on his old server for a while, but within a few weeks we persuaded him to join us on the new one. I had heated conflicts with Simana during every week that I was at Father's house. All I wanted to do was play WoW, and Simana strictly limited my playtime. Because my new room was just across from hers, she knew what I was doing at every single second. She was breathing down my neck the whole time. 
She kept making me do chores around the house. I despised doing work around the house, especially since we had a nanny who was supposed to do it. If I made a scene about doing the work, she took away my laptop for a day or two. This was the most horrible thing she could do to me, to take away my only source of joy left in the world. She sometimes did it even when father was at home, and father didn't lift a finger to stop her. My first year of independence high school came to an end very quickly. Nothing eventful really happened there, and I barely interacted with anyone. I would just go there for my required time, do my work, and go home. I was too absorbed in my game to care about anything else. At father's house, in the beginning of the summer, I was introduced to someone who I would hate for a very long time, Leo Bubenheim. Alex Bubenheim married a German woman named Karina who had just moved to the U.S. with her two kids, Leo and Polina, who became Alex's stepchildren. They would then always come over as a family. Leo was 12 years old, and Polina was a year younger than me. My fear of girls made me keep my distance from Polina. She was a total bitch anyway, and her attitude would only get worse. She is a true representative of everything I hate about women. When I first met Leo, I didn't think much of him. He was only 12 years old. I just thought of him as Lucas. Well, I think that's brother. good enough I for this no session. We've got him. about halfway through the book. We'll have another streaming session where we'll get through the other half of it. So I hope everybody enjoyed this. Have a good weekend, and I'll talk to you all later.